I never expected a night like this, even working in an elite secret Native American unit assigned to hunt folklore creatures. My name's Asher Greyfeather, and I've seen plenty of strange stuff over the years, but nothing has ever left me as shaken as that encounter. We were stationed somewhere in rural Arizona. I won't disclose the precise location, but trust me, it was honestly creepy. You wouldn't expect anything out of the ordinary to happen here, but that's what made it even scarier. The team consisted of five members, including me, Commander Red Bear, my trusted friend Mia Little Wind, Xavier Nightwalker, and Tommy Swift Arrow. We were all skilled with guns and knives and had received rigorous training to handle supernatural dangers. Late one evening, we headed out on our usual patrol route. As Commander Red Bear briefed us on the mission's specifics, our attention was suddenly seized by a pair of glowing eyes peering at us from the edge of the darkness. We froze in place. A thick tension filled the air. Shakily, I joked. Guys, did you know snapping gum is illegal on Earth? An alien can arrest you for that, trying to defuse the tension. As Mia chuckled nervously beside me, those eyes kept staring at us. Then it started, that eerie scratching sound coming from all directions in an unpredictable crescendo. The guttural noises sent waves of panic through everyone. Commander Red Bear signaled for us to take cover behind a decrepit old shed. The stranger's presence felt genuinely unnerving. Its eyes radiated unstinted malevolence. When it finally emerged from those shadows into the moonlight, we got a clear glimpse of it. This creature was like nothing any of us had ever seen before in our many missions hunting folklore monsters. It stood at least seven feet tall, with unnaturally long limbs extending from a skeletal torso covered in dark, slimy scales that glistened under the soft light. Its fingers ended in razor-sharp claws, and festering wounds adorned its body. Its mouth was filled with rows of jagged teeth, twisted in a grin that oozed malicious intent. As I stared at this figure, I realized that, Despite all our training, we had never faced something so terrible and grotesque. The creature began advancing towards us, its breathing now a deafening rasp. Xavier grabbed his gun, and I clutched my knife as we prepared to face the vile monster before us. The others did the same. I don't have much time left, Mia said suddenly, her voice serious. All of you escape while you still can. In a brave attempt to buy us some time, she hurled her weapon at the creature's head, momentarily disorienting it. With no time to process her words or actions, Commander Red Bear took charge and led U.S. towards safety through a gaping hole in the shed wall. As we sprinted away from the horrifying beast, we heard Mia's agonizing screams behind us but couldn't afford to look back. Our priority was surviving this nightmare and regrouping later to figure out our next move. The lumbering creature roared as it picked up speed in its pursuit of our desperate group. We ran as fast as our legs could carry us, trying to put as much distance between ourselves and the creature as possible. We couldn't afford to call for help. Our radios were scrambled by something, rendering them useless, and we had no other means of communication. Our survival instincts kicked in, and we focused on one thing and one thing only, escape. As we moved through the dark woods, zigzagging between trees, we heard the creature's unsettling roars and the snapping of branches as it pursued us relentlessly. Each time it seemed like we were gaining some distance, its howls grew louder and closer, jolting our exhausted bodies into action. Eventually, Commander Red Bear ordered us to split up, hoping that dividing the monster's attention might give some of us a chance to escape. We hesitated, 
doubting the plan but knowing that there was no other option. With heavy hearts and a shared look of despair, we scattered in different directions. I found myself alone in an unfamiliar part of the forest. I had no idea where my colleagues had run to or if they were even alive. The silence surrounding me weighed down on me like a blanket. Not once did I dare make a noise. Through sheer perseverance, I managed to locate an old abandoned house hidden deep within the woods after hours of running. I remembered seeing this building in one of our mission briefings. It was known locally as a haunted place with a gruesome history surrounding it. Despite my better judgment and exhaustion gnawing at my sanity, I decided to enter. It seemed like my best bet for finding shelter from the monstrous antagonist that chased us relentlessly. Inside the house, it was dark and damp. The floorboards creaked under my weight, and my every breath echoed off the rotting walls. As I crept further in, I noticed broken furniture littered across the floor where previous occupants had hastily fled years ago. Suddenly, I heard a crash outside, followed by screams belonging to Xavier. The impact filled me with dread. It meant that the creature was not far behind. With no other option, I barricaded myself in a small room, hoping that my scent would be masked by the stench of decay that prevailed throughout the house. Time crawled by as I cowered in that cramped space, my heart pounding in my ears. Moments turned into hours as the sounds of pursuit faded, and silence enveloped the house once again. Believing the creature may have moved on, I finally built up the courage to leave my hiding spot. Moving cautiously but swiftly, I made my way back towards our headquarters through the eerily quiet woods. Upon arriving, I found our base in disarray. It looked like a war zone, weapons scattered on the ground, broken equipment everywhere, and vehicles abandoned mid-evacuation. Tears welled up in my eyes as I surveyed the scene. My colleagues were nowhere to be found, and it became apparent that whatever remained of my team had met a grisly end at the hands of this terrifying creature. Exhausted, with despair settling heavily on me, I retreated to our base's wreckage, only to find Mia's lifeless body, brutally mangled and barely recognizable. Those empty eyes stared unblinkingly at the crescent moon above us, her sacrifice having been in vain. It was then that it dawned on me what this hideous thing truly was, an Awazapo, a monstrous beast from Aztec mythology known for its penchant for human flesh and unspeakable strength. Until tonight, we had dismissed it as an old legend, but now that line between myth and reality has blurred irrevocably. As I stood there in sorrow at what remained of our shattered lives and lost comrades, the air around me grew colder and more oppressive with every passing second. An all-too-familiar roar pierced the night, and I knew my time had come. I was kneeling beside the body, inspecting an unfamiliar symbol carved into the victim's back. A heavy sigh escaped my lips. My hands, covered in protective gloves, carefully traced the shape of the strange mark as I contemplated its meaning. There was no time to dawdle, though. I'm a part of a top-secret Native American unit and we specialize in hunting and eliminating unusual creatures from folklore that terrorize innocent people. I'm Coda Sandoval, and this was just another gruesome crime scene. As I continued my investigation, I heard my partner Gabriella approach me from behind. Her footsteps were cautious but steady. Coda, she whispered in urgency. Did you find anything? Yeah. I replied in a hushed tone. This mark doesn't resemble anything we've come across before. 
It must be the work of a new creature, one we haven't dealt with yet. Gabriella's eyes widened in disbelief as she surveyed the scene. Can it be a new breed or species? She questioned, her voice heavy with concern. It's possible. I muttered, rising to my feet. Every muscle in my body tensed as my heartbeat quickened. We have to notify our superiors immediately. Before we could leave, a blood-curdling scream pierced through the air, making us look at each other in terror. We need to move, I said, grabbing Gabriella's hand and pulling her along as we ran towards the source of the sound. In front of us lay another mutilated body, its limbs twisted grotesquely and its face contorted beyond recognition. Kneeling beside it was a creature that we'd never seen before. It had sharp fangs dripping with blood and pitch-black skin adorned with wicked-looking spikes. It was crouched over its latest prey like a feral beast. My instincts kicked in as I pulled out my gun, aiming it at the creature. Gabriella followed suit, placing a hand on my shoulder for support. You take the right, I'll take the left. I instructed her. But we never got to fire our weapons. The creature suddenly let out a gut-wrenching howl and leaped towards us at lightning speed. It was as if time slowed down right in front of us. Our first instinct was to dodge the attack. My heart threatened to give out at any moment. Run, I told Gabriella and together we sprinted away from the beast as it chased after us like a predator hunts its prey. We had no way of knowing if we would even survive this encounter, but our training had taught us that we couldn't give up without a fight. Darting through the hazy night, every corner we turned seemed to lead nowhere. It continued pursuing us relentlessly, and each time we thought we'd lost it, it would appear again with another wild lunge. The intensity of this chase reached its peak as Gabriella and I stumbled upon a dead-end alleyway with nowhere left to run. We turned back, our hearts pounding in our chests, ready to confront our otherworldly nemesis. As the creature slinked closer with an unnervingly cat-like gait, Gabriella whispered urgently into my ear, We have no choice. Take it down. With the beast closing in, it became clear that we couldn't outrun our predator. Our chances of survival grew increasingly slim, but we had no choice but to fight back. Gabriella, when I shoot, you aim for the legs. I instructed her. She nodded in agreement, understanding that immobilizing the creature might be our only shot at escaping. We aimed our guns and fired in unison. The bullets only seemed to anger the antagonist further, but it did stagger momentarily due to its injured legs. Seeing this as our opportunity, we seized the moment and sprinted away from it. Unfortunately, our escape was short-lived. The creature quickly regained its footing and continued its relentless pursuit. Driven by survival instinct, we zigzagged through the narrow streets in a desperate attempt to confuse our pursuer. As luck would have it, just as we turned a corner, we spotted an old payphone on the sidewalk. Fighting the initial skepticism that crossed my mind, since payphones have become quite uncommon in recent years, I picked up the receiver and dialed the number of our headquarters. To our utter relief, someone picked up on the other end. Help! I gasped out of breath, giving them our location before hanging up in haste. Gabriella and I exchanged a fleeting glance. Hope flickered momentarily in her eyes as well. Minutes felt like hours as we waited for backup with our backs pressed against a brick wall, guns still tightly gripped in our hands. Finally, we heard what sounded like footsteps approaching us at lightning speed. Mustering whatever little strength we had left, Gabriella and I prepared ourselves to confront our foe one more time. But then something unexpected happened, 
three members of our team burst onto the scene with their guns aimed directly at the creature. As they fired multiple rounds at its body, ultimately forcing it to retreat, our hearts swelled with gratitude for the timely intervention of our allies. We quickly relayed our experiences to our comrades, who grew even more alarmed at our story's gruesome details. Despite our best efforts, we couldn't identify the creature that had haunted us that night. Since its identity remained unknown, it wasn't possible to predict or understand its abilities and motives. Our enemy had retreated, but the ordeal was far from over. Over the following days, more mutilated bodies were discovered in various locations across town, sending chills down everyone's spines. Our unit, as well as other law enforcement agencies, increased their presence in a bid to curb the mysterious creature's murderous spree. Despite all these measures, we were unable to capture or kill the antagonist. However, we did manage to uncover some disturbing information about it in a confidential file. The creature was a product of a top-secret government experiment gone horribly wrong. The revelation confirmed our suspicions that we were dealing with no ordinary beast. Broken in body and spirit, Gabriella and I would constantly be on guard to prevent the next attack but mostly haunted by those we couldn't save from our monstrous foe. When most people think of Chicago, they envision skyscrapers, deep dish pizza, and the famous bean sculpture. But for me, it's a city where nightmares come crawling out of the darkness. It's not something I openly discuss. After all, I'm a member of a secret unit of Native American hunters fighting a constant battle against the monstrous folklore creatures lurking in the shadows. My name is Redford L. Quaker, and this is my encounter with one of those creatures. It was a routine mission at first, something I could handle on my own. My boss had received a call from a terrified woman who couldn't bring herself to leave her apartment on the lower levels of an old building near the city center. She described hearing scratching sounds coming from the walls while sitting in her dimly lit living room. I arrived at the apartment in the early hours of the evening and gave her a gentle knock on the door. Upon entering, I noticed that she was trembling with fear. It was evident from her dilated pupils and quivering lip, and let out a shuddering breath as she began to recount her nightmare and all that was plaguing her mind. The scratching wasn't new. It had started months ago, but had gradually grown more insistent and aggressive. Our conversation was interrupted by shuffling noises directly outside her apartment door accompanied by guttural groans that sent chills throughout my body. I immediately sprang into action, motioning for the woman to stay put as I edged towards the door. In one fluid motion, I yanked open the door and came face to face with something truly otherworldly, an enormous creature covered in fur with glowing red eyes that seemed fueled by unadulterated rage and malevolence. Long claws extended from its massive hands, scraping against the hardwood floor and carving deep gouges. Any other person might have collapsed in terror or screamed for help at the sight of this monster, but I had been trained for this. Conditioning my mind to stay calm and collected in the worst of situations was all part of my specialized training. Redford, is everything all right? The woman asked hesitantly from behind me. Her voice trembled as tears welled up in her eyes. Stay back! I shouted, never breaking eye contact with the creature. I did my best to keep my voice steady, but it was difficult given the circumstances. Tension was building rapidly as our standoff wore on. The air seemed to crackle with a potent mixture of fear and anticipation. 
As we stared each other down, I slowly reached for the knife holstered at my side, knowing full well that it may not be enough to take this monstrosity down. There was too much risk involved. The creature's agility and strength could easily overpower me if I wasn't careful. Regardless, it was my duty to protect the innocent lives of those dwelling in this city. Before making my move, another member of our unit burst through the door, Quinn Alvarado, armed to the teeth with weapons and backed by several more members waiting outside. The creature immediately recognized its imminent peril and let out a harrowing screech before charging at us with terrifying speed and ferocity. Quinn tackled me out of harm's way just in time as the beast lunged at us with its claws slashing through the air where our throats had been an instant earlier. We both hit the ground hard, wincing at the pain that coursed through our bodies upon impact. However, there was no time to assess injuries. We needed to take action right away before our monstrous foe regained its bearings. As we tried to rise to our feet, the creature regrouped and threw itself at us once more, its teeth snapping hungrily within inches of our faces. The other members of our unit charged into the cramped apartment like a well-oiled machine, doing their best to subdue the relentless monster. Though their bravery was admirable, we all knew that capturing the creature alive was exceedingly difficult, if not impossible. Our fearless team persisted relentlessly, attacking the cruel terror with an arsenal of weapons and well-executed combat techniques. Though the creature fought back brutally, slashing and clawing with incredible speed and strength, it became evident that it was starting to lose ground as it backed into a corner. But just as victory seemed almost within our reach, the monster managed to break through one of the walls of the apartment in a final desperate gamble for freedom. It quickly fled into the night, leaving a gaping hole in the wall and a terrified woman in its wake. Our unit was in hot pursuit, with Quinn and I leading the charge. We knew that it wouldn't be long before the creature harmed others, and we couldn't let that happen. Dodging through alleyways, over fences, and along rooftops, we relentlessly tracked the creature throughout the city. It seemed to always be one step ahead of us, as if it knew our every move. We dared not call for backup, not until we could pinpoint its location to properly contain it. The gory aftermath of its violent spree became all too clear when we stumbled upon its victims, innocent people who had been viciously attacked and left with horrifying injuries or worse. Witnessing such a gruesome scene only fueled our determination to hunt down this menace once and for all. As the sun began to rise, we finally cornered the creature in a derelict warehouse on the outskirts of town. It snarled at us menacingly, its red eyes seething with anger and bloodlust. I turned to Quinn and asked, Why do you think it hasn't attacked yet? Not since last night's rampage. Quinn frowned, replying, Hard to say. Maybe it's waiting for an opportunity to strike when our guard is down. Our team members took up positions around the building's perimeter while Quinn and I cautiously entered through a rusted metal door. We could hear its ragged breathing echoing throughout the cavernous space. Suddenly an explosion tore through one of the warehouse walls. The creature had outsmarted us yet again. It barreled through the makeshift exit, heading straight towards a densely populated area nearby. We frantically chased after it, but quickly realized that we would never catch up in time to prevent another slaughter. Desperate for help, I made a split-second decision to use our unit's emergency call line. I knew that assistance wouldn't arrive in time to help us capture the creature, but perhaps it could give the local police enough warning to evacuate potential victims. As we slowed our pace, our breaths heavy with fatigue, we watched in dismay as the creature disappeared into the distance. 
The devastation it had caused throughout our city would not be easily forgotten, and the lives lost weighed heavily on us. Despite our best efforts, we had failed. We had neither stopped nor captured this monstrous being. But we couldn't allow these losses to completely consume us. We had a duty to remain vigilant in the fight against such creatures, knowing full well that more would inevitably emerge in the shadows. Looking back on what transpired, I can now say I understand who this murderous creature really was, a horrifying manifestation of terror known as a Wendigo. As a seasoned hunter, I had seen a myriad of supernatural creatures in my time with the special unit. From bloodthirsty Wendigos to shape-shifting skinwalkers, I thought I had seen it all. But this case was different from any others I had encountered before. My fellow Native American colleagues in the secret unit and I were called out to investigate an unusual occurrence in a small rural town in Idaho. Locals reported grisly scenes of mutilated cattle, and whispers of something prowling on the edge of town struck terror within their hearts. Upon arrival in that carefully anonymous town, my partner, Kaya Brownstone, and I decided to split up to gather as much information as possible. As we mingled with incredulous townsfolk, it quickly became apparent that the situation was worse than what we initially anticipated. Animals were being slaughtered or abducted with alarming frequency, and people were afraid and trapped by circumstance. What was supposed to be just another midnight recon mission quickly descended into chaos. A blood-curdling scream cut through the eerie silence chilling my bones like an arctic wind snapping through the air. Kaya and I exchanged glances before dashing toward the sound. Nothing could have prepared us for the grisly sight that awaited us. The alleyway was soaked with red, the dark crimson pooling around our boots as we took in grim curiosity what had transpired before us. A man, or rather, what was left of him, lay crumpled against the chipped brick wall, his flesh torn apart as if he'd been ripped limb from limb by something monstrous. My senses screamed with danger as Kaya rested her hand on my shoulder. We need to find this thing, she whispered fearfully. In all our years hunting these creatures of folklore, nothing could compare to the malice that stained every corner of this unassuming town. Still reeling from the sheer brutality of our discoveries, we doubled our efforts to uncover the identity and motive of our elusive enemy. Days passed, and no matter how tirelessly we searched, the creature responsible remained just out of reach. The sense of helplessness that weighed heavy on my heart bore unfamiliar pangs of fear. Perhaps this time, I wouldn't be able to pin down a solution. Others in the secret unit shared my concerns, but their grim faces were etched with steely determination. In the darkness of nightfall, we hatched one final plan to bring our foe to light. We gathered in the alleys and prepared for battle. Armed with ancient Native American weapons and sacred rituals, we pressed forth into the darkness, each step bringing us closer to our sinister quarry. A gust of wind rushed through the desolate streets as we trudged onward, our eyes sharply scanning corners and shadows alike. I noticed barely perceptible movement in a nearby alleyway and signaled for my teammates to surround it. Drawing closer, the sight that met our eyes was both horrifying and baffling. At the mouth of the alley stood an entity revolting to behold, its twisted visage carved from countless nightmares that had tormented innocent minds throughout the ages. Its appearance was indefinite in its disgust, a grotesque amalgamation of limbs and features from various shadows and folklore. Who are you? I called out hesitantly, 
Even experienced hunters must take care when confronting previously unknown monsters. The creature whispered its response, its voice like nails scraping against chalk. Shall remain unspoken. With that simple confirmation, ferocity surged through our veins as we swung into action. Relentless in our pursuit, we drove the wicked entity back until it was cornered by walls thick with grime, then stood poised with weapons raised, ready for what came next. As adrenaline spiked throughout my entire body, I could feel time slowing down around me while memories of past hunts flashed through my mind, urging me forward. Amidst the frenzy, I caught a glimpse of pain in the creature's eyes as we fought with all our might. Initially, it seemed absurd to sympathize with that which brings terror. But deep within those desperate and dark windows of its soul, there was a rawness that struck me. In that split-second pause, the creature lunged for me. The impact knocked me off my feet, and darkness enveloped the edges of my vision. As the abomination prepared to sink its malformed appendages into my flesh, I shrieked and prayed that someone had heard us. The creature hesitated, perhaps sensing something amiss and turned its attention toward the other agent present. Kaya wasted no time in acting and tossed a supernatural flare toward the beast. The flare burst into bright, searing light, causing the creature to recoil in pain. Run! She yelled at me, her eyes locked on our monstrous tormentor. Working on instinct, we sprinted away from the scene, knowing full well that help was quite distant. Our immediate focus became survival rather than capture. It wasn't our typical plan of action, but given our lack of knowledge and resources about this creature, it seemed like the best course of action. We knew that risking facing this monstrosity alone could mean certain death. As we ran through the desolate streets, we could hear an enraged howl behind us, a clear sign that our pursuer was not done with us just yet. Every corner we turned felt like a life-or-death decision as we wove through the town's murky alleyways. Finally breaking free from the maze of passages, we caught sight of our unit members waiting for us at a discreet location. Utter relief washed over us. They had heard the distress signals we'd sent out earlier. We quickly updated our teammates with the little information we had gathered on this vicious murderer. They listened intently as they caught their breath from their own search efforts. Their faces paled at the details we shared. As we regrouped and developed a swift strategy for taking on this sinister adversary together, it became evident that time was not on our side. From a distance, a symphony of gut-wrenching screams reached our ears, signaling that the creature had claimed yet another victim. Determined to put an end to this reign of terror, we moved out as a unit with our weapons ready. With our combined strength and knowledge, we managed to drive the creature out of its hideout. The monstrous being snarled at us, its elongated limbs twitching grotesquely. It seemed to accept the imminent showdown, a horrifying grin spreading across its face. The battle that ensued was arduous and brutal. We slashed and dodged, barely managing to stave off the creature's relentless onslaught. Our best efforts seemed insufficient against this terrifying menace, whose origins still remained unknown. As the night dragged on and weariness began setting in, I forced myself to think back on everything I had learned from my tribe's elders. I remembered that sometimes understanding an enemy's origin was crucial for overcoming them. With this revelation in mind, I slipped away momentarily from the struggle, rifling through my bag for a particular tool I had acquired earlier, a weathered map describing ancient legends native to this region. Returning to my comrades with fresh resolve, I spoke to them loudly above the roar of battle. The name! I shouted. 
We need its true name. A collective look of realization crossed their faces as they grasped at straws, attempting to produce an answer. Given one last surge of desperation, we confronted the creature once more, narrowing down legends in a final attempt to reveal its true identity. As fate would have it or providence shined upon us, I uttered a name loudly in a powerful chant as our weapons clashed with the beast's grotesque frame. Tornamar! The dreaded nocturnal predator from our region's forgotten folklore sprung into my mind from past elders' tales. At once, the creature shrieked deafeningly as if wounded by sound alone. It staggered away, writhing in agony. Its fury remained undiminished but tempered by confusion and newfound trepidation at what we now held. It seemed that by merely discovering and invoking its true name, we had unearthed an unforeseen vulnerability. However, it wasn't enough to destroy the creature. Instead, it backed into the shadows, leaving us with countless questions about this ancient behemoth and our newfound ability to resist it. My heart pounded in my chest as I adjusted the gear on my backpack, staring at the entrance to the abandoned amusement park. The special Native American folklore unit had briefed me on this mission, but I had no idea what I was going up against. It's for real, man. My partner, Neshoba Wampanoag, said with a nervous chuckle. Don't expect to go home tonight without a story that'll make your friends wet their pants. The park loomed ominously before us, tangled vines hanging from its deteriorating gates. Deserted for decades, it had become a place where gruesome incidents were whispered about but never confirmed. Neshoba, I started to ask when he hushed me quickly. We picked our way through the entrance and cautiously explored the park. Stifling our unease, we moved silently through the moonlit paths between rusting rides and buckling attractions. We rounded a corner where we stumbled upon the remains of what appeared to be an employee break area, with one very disturbing addition. An out-of-place chunk of twisted metal and glass lay shredded among decaying tables and chairs. Dried blood splattered around this gruesome find sent a shiver up my spine. It doesn't look like an animal did this, Neshoba muttered. Our confidence waned more with each step we took to investigate. What kind of folklore creature could? I trailed off as Neshoba raised his hand to signal silence. A chilling screech echoed through the park followed by an unnerving thud that shook the ground beneath us. We were seasoned agents trained to deal with horrifying creatures from legend, but nothing could have prepared us for this encounter. A monstrous silhouette with blood-smeared claws came barreling toward us, its body a grotesque amalgamation of muscle and bone. Our hearts raced as we yanked our weapons from their holsters as a precaution. We stared in horror as we saw the creature's face, a mixture of familiar features twisted into a bizarre, horrifying visage. Our initial shock evaporated, replaced by burning adrenaline as Neshoba shouted at me. We stick together. I'll take the left, you take the right. Diverting our focus to either side of the monster, we pressed forward in an attempt to drive it back. The creature's movements became erratic, lunging at us with unpredictable swiftness and force. We readjusted our tactics on the fly, trying to outweat this seemingly unstoppable foe. Despite its unnatural agility and strength, I felt a fleeting moment of hope that the two of us could subdue the creature. I shivered at the thought of what happened to the people who had come across the beast alone. Did they even stand a chance? Suddenly, the creature let out a deafening roar, tossing Neshoba through the air and into a nearby Ferris wheel. 
I caught my breath as he groaned, disoriented but alive for the moment. I couldn't let my partner down. Mustering all my courage, I charged full speed at the demon with gritted teeth while it was distracted by Nishoba's fate. Time seemed to slow down as I dodged clawed appendages that sliced through metal poles with sickening ease. The ground shook under our blows with an intensity that left me breathless. I scrambled for my knife and plunged it deep into one of its monstrous limbs. The creature roared and trembled in fury before swiping at me with massive force. With my partner injured and unable to help, calling for backup was our only hope. However, the creature's onslaught became relentless, its grotesque form lunging at me again and again. I knew that if I stopped to call for help, it would attack me mercilessly. There was simply no time. Nishoba managed to regain his footing, his face contorted with pain but determined to fight. He shouted, Distract it! I'll try to flank it! I nodded and grabbed a nearby piece of debris, hurling it at the beast with all my strength. As the creature recoiled from the attack, Nishoba moved around it quickly and silently, the predator now becoming prey. The minutes dragged on like hours as we executed a deadly dance with the monster, careful not to let it corner us or pin us down. In this dire situation, we knew verbal communication would be dangerous, alerting the creature to our intentions, so we relied on silent signals and understanding each other's movements. Our joint effort took its toll on the beast. It seemed to slow down as it bared deep gashes and wounds inflicted upon it by us. But still, its supernatural life force clung on. Then, in a brief moment of synchronicity, Nishoba and I both attacked from opposite sides simultaneously. Our coordinated strike resulted in a brutal impact as our weapons met in the middle of the creature's body. An ear-piercing shriek erupted from the monster as a torrent of black ichor gushed out of its wounds like a grotesque fountain. The beast finally stumbled backward in defeat before collapsing onto the ground. But neither Nishoba nor I dared celebrate just yet. Our instincts told us that this fight was far from over. Our instincts were right. Within moments, we watched in shock as the seemingly lifeless form twitched violently. It reached into its open wounds and began pulling something out, the dead, mutilated bodies of its previous victims. The grotesque sight became a realization that struck us cold. We were not just fighting some strange folklore creature. We were fighting a deranged human with an inhuman desire for violent carnage. Though exhausted and breathless, the surge of terror was enough for me to pull out my radio. We need backup. We have an active human murderer in our hands, possibly wrapped in some kind of folklore creature disguise. Nishoba was a lichen, a supernatural being with the ability to detect other lichens, and confirmed our suspicions as he growled. I don't know how this is possible. But I can sense it's a skinwalker. That's why it didn't register as a lichen. Before the horror could sink in, the creature gurgled something barely understandable. It had been collecting victims to bring about the rebirth of its race. With that chilling revelation, it let out an ear-splitting scream and disappeared into the darkness. Still alive, still dangerous. As we stood in shock from what we experienced and the truth behind the antagonist's identity, we knew that a new nightmare was lurking, and this time, it would be much harder to confront. After months of tedious paperwork, I had finally been granted permission to join my tribe's enigmatic special unit, an elite force of Native American agents dedicated to hunting mythological creatures. 
I always thought such things only existed in the ramblings of drunken elders murmuring incoherent tales by a dying fire. This secret department always made me skeptical, but boy, was I wrong. Jake to Hivers, came a raspy voice from behind me, startling me. I thought you'd be taller. I turned around and saw a balding middle-aged man with a graying beard. He held out his callous hand. Call me Stan, he said, smiling warmly. Stan spotted deer. We shook hands firmly, and he got right to business. Jake, today's the day we'll delve into your first mission. Our informants have been whispering about some strange occurrences at the local hospital. Stan clicked through a series of photographs on his computer before continuing. Nurses are disappearing without a trace. As we went through the case files and photographic evidence, my skepticism began to boil over. We're seriously entertaining the idea that this is some mythical creature? I asked Stan incredulously. For all we know, it could just be another messed up human. Stan sighed deeply before replying. Trust me, Jake. I felt the exact same way on my first mission. But keep your mind open and stay vigilant. You have no idea what may lurk in the darkest corners of reality. We arrived at the hospital hours after nightfall and noticed immediately that its atmosphere wasn't right. There was an unmistakable tension in the air that unnerved both Stan and me. Suddenly, our walkie-talkies hissed to life. It was our backup team reporting frenzied movement in the building's sub-basement. Our instincts commanded us not to ignore this. As we descended the stairs into the darkness below, a low growling sound echoed, followed by the reverberation of bone-chilling laughter. Stan and I exchanged nervous looks but proceeded cautiously, weapons at the ready. We entered a dimly lit room filled with medical equipment. The metallic odor of blood hung heavy in the air. My heart pounded. I wasn't prepared for what we might find. Pooling on the floor in the corner was a mass of dark liquid and sinew that was impossible to identify. My hand cursed uncontrollably when suddenly I saw a set of black. Elongated claws emerged from behind an overturned hospital bed. The creature walked on all fours. It had milky white eyes that glittered with malice, and its grin stretched from one side of its horrifying face to the other, bearing rows of monstrously sharp teeth. Stan quickly took aim at the nightmare with a swift motion while shouting at it to halt. Freeze! Or I swear... The creature lunged forward with a speed unimaginable. Blood was gushing like cascading waterfalls as it struck out violently toward us without showing any sign of fear or slowing down. Stan and I froze, realizing the situation we were in. Talking through clenched teeth, I whispered to him, We need help, Stan. This thing is dangerous. Too dangerous. We can't radio for backup now. Let's move out of this room and call them then. He replied as we slowly backed away from the creature. The creature continued coming at us, fervently tearing through anything between it and us. We narrowly escaped into the hallway and slammed the door shut behind us. Catching our breaths, Stan quickly radioed for backup. I don't think they'll make it here soon enough. I said as we heard the creature's relentless assault on the door. We have to buy some time, Stan decided. We started looking around for potential barricades, something we could use to slow the creature down while waiting for backup. We piled up whatever heavy items we found, medical equipment, furniture, even a broken vending machine all in an attempt to block the doorway leading to that horrifying room where the creature was trapped. It wasn't long before it broke through the feeble barrier we had set up. The creature attacked, 
brutally slaughtering anyone who stood in its way. I could only watch in horror as it snatched one of our teammates and tore him apart with frenzied abandon. I snapped out of my state of shock and focused on staying alive. I fired a few rounds at the creature, but nothing seemed to affect it. It kept coming at us with relentless determination, forcing us to retreat further back into the hospital. During our attempted escape, we found a computer lab locked from the outside. The door was reinforced and looked strong enough to at least hold off the creature temporarily. Stan glanced over at me as if seeking approval before he unlocked it quickly. As soon as we stepped inside and slammed the door shut, we reinforced it with a heavy filing cabinet. Stan continued attempting to contact our backup, desperately trying to update them on the severity of the situation. The creature had become eerily silent, as if it sensed our increasing panic. Finally, after what felt like hours, we could hear our backup team's footsteps approaching the lab. We notified them of the situation and left the room cautiously. The team appeared well prepared for this nightmarish creature, but as they ventured further into the hospital, there was an overwhelming unease in the air. The creature seemed to have vanished without a trace. Our surroundings were butchered beyond recognition. Blood was smeared everywhere, and grisly mementos of its victims were left behind. It was horrifying beyond words. The backup team examined the area thoroughly and concluded that the creature had somehow escaped through a gutted air shaft. Whether it fled out of instinct or cunning was impossible to determine. Finally, someone from our support staff approached us and handed over a stack of papers she had found hidden in one of the offices. The documents described gruesome experiments performed on a single patient here at the hospital years earlier. She grew increasingly excited as she described her findings. This patient underwent numerous experimental procedures against their will, which ultimately resulted in death, but not before they exhibited incredible mutations and physical abnormalities. In an instant, it all made sense. This wasn't some mythical creature. It was a human once subjected to unimaginable torture and unthinkable experiments that transformed them into an uncontrollable monster. The identity of this attacker remained unknown, but its very existence would continue to haunt us all in ways we never could have anticipated. I never imagined I'd encounter something like this during my career. It was the kind of thing that sounded like a campfire story too fantastic to be true. My name is Nail Dash, and I am as naive and dedicated as they come. As an investigator for a secret government task force, I specialize in tracking down the unidentified creatures that exist in Native American folklore. We typically worked on cases involving unknown predators, strange sightings, and abnormal disappearances that left law enforcement baffled. It was a stormy night in mid-November when it happened. I was off-duty near my hometown of Elk Grove Village in Illinois, not a particularly thrilling region, but its familiarity always comforted me. The rain lashed against the windows of small businesses and suburban homes as I splashed through the dark streets seeking the nearest storefront to take refuge from the storm. I rushed into a garage-turned-workshop where local craftsmen sold their handmade items, shaking my hair and jacket free of water droplets. Dozens of wood carvings adorned the walls, bobcats, foxes, turtles, etc., all masterfully brought to life by skilled handiwork. While browsing around the room, Waiting for the torrent outside to subside, one particular figurine caught my eye. 
It stood about two feet tall with ominous features etched into its wooden face, something I had never seen before despite my extensive knowledge of folklore creatures. The figure had gruesome claws that seemed to be made for ripping flesh from bone and rows of serrated teeth that looked terrifying enough to make you shudder. Quite a piece there. An elderly lady observed as she approached me from behind, causing me to flinch at her sudden appearance. This is what they call a telk, a hunter of souls known to terrorize victims in rural areas. She explained. We continued conversing about various folklore tales until an abrupt sound silenced our chatter. An ear-piercing screech followed by the crash of a car window shattering nearby. Rushing out to investigate, I'd barely registered the cold rain as it battered my face. I glanced down an alleyway and caught sight of what appeared to be a hulking form, almost lost in the shadows. It stood over a mutilated body, half in and half out of a mangled car. The blood-smeared metal resembled something that had driven through a butcher shop, spilling all its contents onto the street. You go back inside. I instructed the elderly lady, who looked petrified at what she had just seen. As she retreated reluctantly, I approached the scene cautiously but did not anticipate what happened next. The hulking figure turned to face me, revealing with gut-wrenching clarity that it was indeed the telk, its jagged teeth dripping with fresh blood. My heart raced simultaneously with fear and disbelief. Could such a creature truly exist? If so, why has it never crossed my path before? In that moment of distraction, the telk leaped onto another car and vanished into the stormy night. I stood there in shock grappling with the realization that we were no longer hunting cryptids with seemingly unlikely existences. One was now stalking us directly under our noses. Without waiting for daylight to break, I gathered my team, recounting every detail of my harrowing experience. Tension built as we scrutinized every report assigned to our unit but found nothing like the telk. We began drawing connections between unsolved cases, mutilated bodies found in alleys and vehicles pulled off roads from unknown forces, piecing together horrific similarities that could likely be attributed to this nagging new threat. As more witnesses came forward describing ghastly encounters involving the Telk, we delved deeper into darkness during our mission to rid our world of such terror. Delirious and unfit for rest, our investigation took us to the heart of an abandoned warehouse, where shrieks of pain and mayhem echoed against its deteriorating walls. The telk emerged from the shadows with inhuman speed, its bloodlust indiscriminate as it lunged at the nearest investigator. We abandoned protocol, engaging in a brutal battle for survival. My focus was on protecting my team, but I knew deep down that this malevolent creature might just be beyond our control. We fought the Telk relentlessly, but it seemed to predict our every move. Its claws slashed through the air, tearing apart everything in its path. Our weapons seemed to have little effect on it, just momentarily stunning it before it resumed its lethal rampage. One by one, my team members fell, but as the investigator responsible for bringing us together, I couldn't allow myself to be defeated. Given our bleak situation, I realized that calling for backup was a necessity. However, any external communication would require leaving cover and putting myself squarely in the line of fire. Biting back the fear that threatened to engulf me, I swiftly darted toward our wounded communication equipment. As I hastily transmitted a distress signal before retreating back to cover, the telk noticed my movements and began stalking towards me. In an attempt to buy some time for help to arrive, I led the creature on a twisted chase throughout the warehouse with the hope of confounding it enough to even out the odds. 
To my surprise, my tactic worked better than anticipated. As we navigated narrow corridors and makeshift barricades, I discovered chilling paintings adorning disused parts of the warehouse that depicted scenes eerily similar to my current plight. Despite such unexpected findings, I forced myself forward without regret or second thought. With passing moments marked by pursuit and evasion within that unhinged labyrinth, relief finally flooded me when backup sirens resounded in the distance. The arrival process was slow, agonizingly so, with various law enforcement agents forming positions as they tried to make sense of my harried instructions. There was still no sign of capture or defeat, though cornered within its lair, the Telk remained unparalleled in strength and ferocity. Yet knowing there were more on our side created a combined force that managed to halt its advance until we could ascertain an effective means of immobilization. Multiple gunshots echoed throughout as snipers positioned themselves along the warehouse perimeter. The creature hissed and raged as it writhed under the continuous barrage, though each freshly inflicted wound seemed only to agitate rather than subdue it. It wasn't until one of the agents tossed a net lined with metallic strands toward the monster that we witnessed a significant change. Electricity coursed through the material, causing it to collapse and convulse before slumping motionless to the ground. The fight was finally over. The aftermath needed precise handling as we cautiously approached the subdued Telk and began studying its primal form up close. I couldn't help but realize that, despite its captured state, the origin of such a creature remained a mystery beyond our darkest nightmares and continued to pose an immediate threat and reminder of all our fallen comrades. As we rounded up what remained of my team and tended to injuries, I suddenly noticed peculiar-looking tribal emblems marked along crates stacked in the warehouse's dark corners. These markings bore an uncanny resemblance to those I had seen in the garage-turned-workshop where I came across the wooden figurine. It dawned on me that perhaps this ghastly creation hadn't arisen from some unknown terror after all. Instead, its sinister existence may have been unleashed by our very own ignorance in meddling with these artifacts of ancient legend. I stood at the entrance of an abandoned warehouse, located on the outskirts of a small, rural town in Montana. The crunch of gravel beneath my boots seemed deafening, even though I knew I was far from civilization. I swept my flashlight around, curiosity and trepidation mingling within me as I studied my surroundings. The warehouse was covered in moss and vines, giving an indication that it had not been used in decades. The chain-link fence surrounding it was torn apart in multiple locations, providing ample opportunities for unauthorized entry. As I stepped over the broken fence and approached the entrance cautiously, I noticed an acrid odor permeating the air, something akin to decay mixed with chemicals. Pausing for a brief moment to take a deep breath, I reminded myself that this wasn't just another routine mission. My unit, a top-secret division of Native Americans tasked with hunting down nightmarish creatures from folklore, had sent me here after receiving unsettling reports from the locals about unusual activities taking place inside this warehouse. Suddenly, the door creaked open just enough to let out a soft moan that unsettled my nerves further. A chill ran down my spine as I clenched my fist around the flashlight and stepped inside. The darkness seemed to swallow most of the light as I moved deeper into the warehouse. Crates and boxes were strewn all over the place. Some toppled over as if they'd been thrown aside by something powerful and impatient. In one corner lay what looked like a pile of rags, 
until I flashed my light upon it and discovered it was actually a disheveled man, unconscious but still breathing. Hey! I called out to him, hoping to get some answers, but decided not to press further when he showed no signs of response. Who knew how long he had been lying there? As I continued exploring the musty corridors filled with cobwebs and debris, an unnerving sound reached my ears, a scuttling noise echoing through the shadows. Anticipating an imminent confrontation, I gripped my firearm tight, my finger resting uncomfortably just outside the trigger guard. Then, without the slightest warning, a grotesque figure lunged towards me from the darkness, its foul breath hot against my face. It resembled an ancient gargoyle, with menacing horns protruding from its head and leathery wings folded up behind its back. Its eyes glowed with an eerie blue light, and its mouth was filled with razor-sharp teeth dripping with a viscous substance. I instinctively reacted by throwing all my weight against this hellish creature, sending both of us crashing into a nearby wall. I managed to kick it off and sprint down the corridor, trying to put some distance between us. This monster was unlike anything I'd faced before on my missions. It seemed to anticipate my actions with deadly accuracy. As it lashed out with claw-like fingers that scraped across the cement walls, leaving deep gouges, I realized that no amount of training or weaponry would be enough to take down this abomination. Throughout our savage battle across the warehouse's dimly lit halls, I stumbled upon more unconscious bodies, civilians who had ventured too close to the warehouse like moths to flame. Their injuries ranged from minor cuts and bruises to broken bones and serious gashes. My heart raced as I dodged and weaved between the beast's brutal assaults, desperately trying to stay out of reach. Though it inflicted excruciating wounds, cracking ribs, and slashing flesh as our fight intensified, there were moments when my quick thinking saved me from certain death. I bolted around another corner, trying to catch my breath as I fumbled with my phone. I couldn't understand why I hadn't called for help earlier. It was so obvious now. Panic had set in, and it clouded my judgment. Calling my unit was just one desperate, trembling dial away. Before I could complete the call, however, the creature was upon me again. In mere seconds it had torn through two other unconscious victims with savage precision. Lifeless bodies convulsed for a moment before lying still. The gruesome scene and the agonized screams echoed in my ears. I was running out of time and options. I desperately scanned a room filled with rusty machinery and discarded metal parts for something to use against the beast. A rusty pipe caught my attention. Not an ideal weapon, but it might be enough to buy some time. I grabbed the pipe and swung it hard at the creature's head as it lunged forward. The metal connected with a sickening crunch, but the monster seemed unfazed by my desperate attack. It reared up on its hindquarters and lashed out again, slashing through my arm with its deadly talons. My vision began to blur as blood poured from my wounds, but I managed to find cover behind a large piece of machinery. Muffled attempts were made at contacting my unit, and after what seemed like an eternity, they answered. Briefly describing the situation, concentration was required more than ever while trying to keep myself conscious. Help is on its way, came their reassuring reply before the line went dead. The creature screeched in frustration as it sensed my weakening state. Its attacks grew more reckless yet persistent. Weakened by blood loss but determined not to let myself die here or let this monster escape into society any further, I continued attempting to evade its vicious onslaughts. Finally, relief surged through me as I heard distant sirens. 
My unit had arrived, reinforcements to end this nightmare. The chilling realization of what the creature really was filled me with dread as it reared up for one last, brutal charge. The sound of gunfire erupted, jolting me back into reality. Heavy bullets rained down on the creature as I struggled to remain conscious. A deafening silence soon settled after the flashes of gunfire ceased, prompting me to peek and open my eyes. Both units and local law enforcement officers surrounded this deformed creature. Despite the reinforcement's intervention, I couldn't shake the feeling that there was more to this monster than met the eye. The scent of fear lingered even after the hideous creature was defeated. As I was loaded into an ambulance, one of my colleagues came to give an update on what they had discovered regarding the beast's origin. This thing, it's a vampirus infernalis, he whispered in disbelief. An ancient vampire demon hybrid thought to have gone extinct centuries ago. A chill crept over what little warmth I had left in my body. This realization brought more questions than answers, along with further horror as to how many more of these monsters might be lurking in the shadows, biding their time before striking at more unsuspecting victims. I stood there, my hands trembling as I stared at the once pristine white floor, now stained with dark blotches. The paint on the walls was peeling, revealing old wooden panels underneath. I couldn't shake the uneasy feeling that clung to me like a shroud, as if something unspeakable had occurred within these walls. My name is Kiran Tanaya and I'd belonged to a highly specialized unit of Native American agents tasked with hunting and eliminating dangerous folklore creatures. We operate under a cloak of secrecy, touching the lives of ordinary people who cross paths with these nightmarish beings. It would be pointless to call for help. Only those within our ranks fully comprehend what we are up against. To everyone else, we sound like madmen spinning tall tales. The grotesque display in front of me was unlike anything I'd ever seen before. Victims lay strewn across the ground, their delicate flesh ripped apart, entrails spilling out onto the floor. Some were unrecognizable, distorted shells of their former selves. My throat tightened as I observed the grisly scene before me. Though battle-hardened through years spent fighting unimaginable horrors, I couldn't help but feel a sliver of terror in the face of such brutality. An unsettling chuckle from behind startled me back to reality. Michael Armijo, my longtime friend and fellow agent on this mission, had entered the room. As we stood side by side, taking in all the carnage, he remarked dryly, you know they say laughter is the best medicine. Unless you're laughing for no reason, then you might need medicine. That remark fleetingly eased my tension, a small reprieve from what lay ahead. We cautiously ventured deeper into the abandoned house, our sharp senses attuned to any sign of danger lurking in its dark corners. It wasn't long until we caught sight of our target— a creature popular in folklore yet unknown to us until now. Its form was grotesque. Twisted limbs sprouted from a gnarled and mangled torso. Razor-like talons adorned each hand, dripping with the blood of its latest victims. Its face, oh God, its face, was a nightmarish visage of pure malice. Needle-like teeth lined a gaping maw that appeared capable of consuming an entire head in one horrifying bite. What struck me most of all was a sense of intelligence lurking behind gleaming, hate-filled eyes. A cunning and sadistic presence that relished the atrocities it committed. Despite every fiber in my being screaming at me to flee, I stood fast beside my partner. 
our resolve solidified with every step closer to the creature. We prepared our weapons, poised to strike with lethal force once it reared its grotesque form at us. Just as we charged, the beast lunged forward with unnatural speed, its claws slashing through the air moments away from piercing Michael's chest. The tension spiked abruptly, quickly reaching fever levels as we collided with the terrifying entity. As Michael and I faced the creature, we knew we couldn't call for help. Doing so would only expose our unit and put others at risk of meeting the same gruesome fate as the victims in this house. We had no choice but to confront the beast ourselves, relying solely on our training and instincts. We fought ferociously, matching the creature's terrifying speed and agility. Michael managed to slash one of its twisted limbs with his weapon, causing the beast to screech in pain. It retaliated by striking him with its razor-sharp talons, leaving him injured and barely able to stand. While I continued to battle the creature, Michael staggered towards the door, attempting to flee from the house. As he struggled to open it, he gasped out a possible escape plan. Kieran, we need to set a trap. Realizing there was no time for debate, I nodded and sprinted towards an abandoned cupboard filled with hazardous materials, rusted nails, broken glass, and decaying wood. I hastily constructed a makeshift trap near an open window that would hopefully impale the creature as it attempted pursuit. During my frantic efforts, the beast saw its opportunity and struck. With surprising strength, fueled by anger and bloodlust, it sent me flying across the room into a heap of debris. Scrambling to my feet in pain, I yelled for Michael to activate the trap as it charged toward us. The timing was crucial. Any moment too soon or too late would mean our deaths. But Michael did not falter. As the creature lunged at us through the window in a final murderous assault, he sprang into action and released the crude trap. The mass of sharp debris struck home. Agonized screams echoed through the house as the monster writhed on the ground, pierced by splintered wood and jagged metal. However, even impaled by our makeshift weapon, the creature refused to die. It thrashed with frightening intensity trying to dislodge the debris and reach us even as its blood stained the floor. Knowing we were unable to vanquish the creature permanently, we retreated from the collapsing house in search of a more permanent solution. We could only hope our unit would provide us with answers on how to kill this seemingly indestructible antagonist. As days passed, we sent word to our fellow agents describing our encounter and seeking knowledge about the vile creature we faced. When their response finally came, it was chilling in its finality. This beast is a Wendigo, a malevolent, nearly invulnerable creature of Native American myth. It was once a human who turned to cannibalism during a time of extreme starvation and desperation. Its transformation into this monstrous entity is irreversible and it feeds on human flesh to sustain its eternal hunger. The revelation that our enemy was once human brought eeriness to the memories of our violent encounter. We knew that ultimately, we had been face to face with what remained of a tormented soul, now trapped in an unending cycle of bloodlust and pain. Although we continued our work of hunting other creatures lurking in the shadows, the memory of that gruesome battle and the question of whether we could ever truly end the Wendigo's reign of terror haunted us always. That fateful Monday, I had just clocked off work at the secretive Native American special unit dedicated to hunting and destroying folklore creatures. My name is John Talbot, and it was my privilege to serve among these elite warriors. On this occasion, 
We received intel about a gruesome crime scene a few miles away from our covert location. I opted to inspect the site alone. As I arrived, my heart sank at the sight of dismembered bodies scattered throughout a seemingly ordinary house. Each victim had been brutally mutilated beyond recognition, leaving blood and viscera smeared across the walls and floors. Tentatively stepping through the carnage, I tried to reach out for help on my radio, but due to some inexplicable interference, my pleas fell silent. As unnerving as this situation was, I couldn't shake off my usual skepticism towards folklore monsters. The carnage laid waste here was beyond measure. While making notes about the scene, I noticed an unusual pattern in the blood spatters, something I had never encountered before in my career. The uneasy tension continued to build as an icy chill creaked into every corner of the room. The silence was shattered by a piercing screech emanating from above. My skeptical instincts were kicked aside by raw survival gut reactions as something descended on me like a boulder dropped from the heavens. A chilling sensation of cold fear ran through me as I finally saw my monstrous foe, its leathery wings folded behind a skeletal frame draped in decaying flesh. The creature let out another terrifying screech as it lunged toward me with razor-sharp teeth and jagged antlers glinting ominously. John! Get out! Came a distant cry that managed to penetrate both the gory clamor and the radio static. Miraculously aware that my comrades were close by, there was no time for disbelief or second-guessing. As the creature lunged again, I barely managed to evade its murderous swipe before quickly retreating towards the exit. I slammed the door, feeling a sense of hopelessness that no sturdy wooden barrier would be able to withstand such a monster. With heavy gasps, I sprinted toward our unmarked vehicle while trying to shake off the tramp's pursuit. Cutting through one last thick curtain of fog, I reached the car teetering on an unstable margin between life and death. My friends were holding their own against smaller, equally terrifying creatures. The night was erupting with deafening cries and whines while my comrades engaged in close-quarter combat with these hellish beings. Using a sharpened barrel stave, Teresa sidestepped gracefully around one of these assailants before thrusting it deep into its sinewy neck. Nice one! Luke called out while kicking another creature clear across the yard as he expertly maneuvered his bowie knife between its ribs. It writhed briefly in agony before succumbing to eternal torment. I fumbled around, securing my radio under my jacket, knowing that our mission had taken an unexpected turn into pure chaos. All sense of victorious camaraderie vanished, when we heard a guttural growl coming from behind us. The lattice shadows grew ever darker around us as we clustered in anticipation of another strike from our terrible adversary. Cresting the edge of the yard, we saw it, a silhouette silkscreen tableau displaying brute force combined with pathos-inducing terror. As the situation grew more dire, we intuitively began to strategize our actions instead of succumbing to fear. Teresa attempted to call for backup, but unfortunately, the radio still seemed to be suffering from interference, rendering her efforts fruitless. The battle with these smaller creatures was intense and bloody, as they appeared to have no mercy or fear. We knew we couldn't handle these monsters on our own for much longer. As we fought, I quickly glanced around the yard and noticed a truck parked nearby with a working CB radio inside. I yelled out my observation to my comrades, and they covered me as I sprinted towards it. I quickly grabbed the microphone and called out for help. My voice raspy with desperation, I provided our current location and the severity of the situation. Although there was still some interference, 
I believed my message was delivered when a faint acknowledgement came through. As we waited, our fight continued, each of us doing anything necessary to keep these relentless creatures at bay. Our expertise in hand-to-hand -hand combat proved useful until every one of them lay lifeless on the ground. The exhaustion was palpable, but there was no time to catch our breaths. The larger creature that had pursued me before was closing in once more. Out of options, we clung to each other as a last defense in hopes of fending off death for a few moments longer. Our hearts raced as it stood before us with its antlers dripping crimson gore, and its skin stretched tightly over its skeletal body. The monstrous creature suddenly stopped in its tracks. Something had caught its attention. A sudden cacophony of sirens filled the air. Our backup had arrived. With this distraction, we seized an opportunity to distance ourselves from it while remaining cautious not to alarm it any further. Together, we retreated slowly toward our arriving colleagues as they surrounded the monster from all directions. As they prepared their weapons and tactics to subdue it, we braced ourselves for the final showdown. As the creature lunged towards us, its enormous form was struck down by a hail of specialized incendiary rounds. But despite the damage inflicted upon it, the creature refused to fall. One of our teammates got injured while attempting to keep it from leaving the location. We knew we had to finish this quickly. Finally, after an intense exchange of gunfire and cunning maneuvering, one well-placed shot hit right between its eyes, and in that instant, the unimaginable nightmare ended. The creature lay dead at our feet, its once terrifying visage now nothing more than a gruesome reminder of our brush with death. We caught our breath and began tending to our wounds as others proceeded to collect samples for further analysis. Curiosity overtook me, and I moved towards the creature's remains to study it more closely. It was then that I saw something that changed everything, a government-issued identification tag hanging around its neck. Though mutilated and bloodied beyond recognition, the tag could still be read, Subject Number 16, Wendigo Experiment 26B This entire time, we were not battling ancient folklore monsters. These creatures were man-made actualizations born from sinister experimentation. Our disbelief turned into horror and anger at such a gruesome revelation, and we knew that this might be just the beginning. I was adjusting my aim, focusing on the suspect. He had taken a hostage, and my partner instructed me to be ready for the takedown. A bead of sweat trickled down my neck, but I ignored the discomfort as I prepared for the shot. Wait, my partner whispered in my earpiece. We got a new target location. Confused but obedient, I shifted my attention away from the suspect. My partner informed me that we had received information about an even more urgent threat. After assembling our gear and hopping into our unmarked car, we sped toward the location. Jules, my partner Ronan asked while gripping the wheel tightly. You ever hear about this place? I've heard nothing but stories, I confessed. But you know how people like to talk. Ronan nodded as we pulled up to an abandoned warehouse on the outskirts of town. The windows were shattered, graffiti covered some walls, and dead trees waved their skeletal branches against the twilight sky. We carefully entered and made our way through the dark halls, flashlights searching for anything unusual. My mind raced with scenarios of what might have brought us here so abruptly. Our footsteps echoed ominously as we eventually found ourselves standing in front of a large, locked metal door. We're here, Ronan said in his no-nonsense voice. 
I had always admired his confidence. We both knew there was no turning back now. As he set to work disabling the lock, I peered through a small gap in the door and saw something that made me feel panicky, unlike anything I've ever experienced before. On the other side of that door lay horrors beyond anything I had ever seen or even imagined. Twisted bodies strewn around an enormous chamber, wearing expressions of utter terror and agony, did not even begin to justify their states. At least none that any normal human mind could accept as reality. And though I couldn't believe it, I saw people we recognized. Colleagues, friends, why were they there? What was going on? Their eyes were wide and lifeless, and their broken limbs were twisted and distorted. It was horrifying. Suddenly, I heard a creature's cry so chilling that it froze my blood, a series of disjointed wails that formed an unspeakable, otherworldly cacophony. The sound resonated deep within me, filling up my very being with bone-chilling dread. The door slammed open, and there it stood, the creature that haunted Native American legends through generations. Its twisted frame towered over our heads and emanated an undeniable, inevitable sense of doom. Jules! Ronan yelled as the monstrous thing lunged toward me. I opened fire blindly, bullets tearing into its form as it screeched in agony at the assault. Ronan joined me in firing round after round at the creature, its putrid blood misting the air around it. But it didn't stop. If anything, it only got angrier. Gaining speed with each stride and becoming more resilient to our flurry of bullets, the creature stormed towards us. We fired so desperately, as if doing so would save us from this disaster. Like lambs being cornered by a terrifying predator, we knew our screams and fights would never be enough to save us. As the creature was upon us and reeled its massive head back to strike, I could see madness swirling within its eyes, deep wells of darkness that held millennia of untold crimes against humanity. The pungent smell of its rotting breath filled my nostrils as we braced ourselves for what we anticipated to be our end. Out of sheer desperation, Ronan and I began to pull back, trying to create some distance between us and the creature. As we moved, our weapons continued to spray a hail of bullets at it, but it seemed unfazed. It was as if the laws of nature ceased to apply when it came to this monstrous being. Despite its horrifying appearance, we couldn't bring ourselves to call for help. Whether it was fear or pride that held us back, we knew our fellow officers wouldn't believe us even if we tried. We had already been dispatched to an undisclosed location for an urgent situation. How could we explain the existence of this nightmarish creature? A particularly gruesome murder crossed my mind as Ronan and I fired on the beast. The victim had been brutally mangled, just like our deceased colleagues in that room. We had seen countless deaths before as detectives, but nothing ever came close to this level of horror. Looking around desperately for any tool, weapon, or escape route available, I noticed a propane tank nearby. With our ammo quickly depleting and the monster's advance unrelenting, this was our last hope. Ronan! I yelled over the chaos, barely audible even with such proximity. The propane tank! There! He saw my gesture and instantly understood. Taking a deep breath, he grabbed my wrist tightly. Jules! Run! Trustingly, I sprinted as fast as I could towards what little cover we could find amongst the debris and crumbling walls of the warehouse. As Ronan drew its attention away from me with continuous gunfire, I prepared myself to make a final stand. As soon as we took position behind a thick concrete support beam, Ronan turned back towards the monster and aimed at the propane tank. 
The shot echoed through the chamber as it struck true. A massive explosion shook the ground beneath us and lit up everything in an inferno's embrace. We sensed more than saw the creature stagger back, letting out an unearthly screech that rattled through the very foundations of the warehouse itself. The raging fire tore away at its massive form in a flurry of undying embers and thick black smoke. But instead of succumbing, the beast started limping towards the exit, attempting to escape our assault. We didn't hesitate. We pursued with all remaining strength, desperately clinging to the hope that we could bring an end to this horrifying ordeal. As the creature approached the exit, it let out a final, tortured cry. It unexpectedly burst through a wall in its frantic bid for freedom, leaving a gaping hole in its wake. Exhausted and covered in soot and sweat, we halted our pursuit when we saw what lay before us, a cemetery littered with graves and tombstones etched with names long forgotten by time. But one gravestone must have been newer than the others. Though worn with age, it still bore the inscription, Skinwalker. This revelation left us horrified, realizing that this cursed being was an ancient malevolence dwelling on these unhallowed grounds. It became evident that this creature had amassed centuries of blood-drenched history before finally encountering us and getting away. Our work as officers could not atone for or address such an ancient evil, for now it had slipped through our fingers. The heavy silence weighed upon us as we tried to salvage any semblance of rationality from this gruesome encounter, a tragedy no investigation could undo. As evening settled over the abandoned factory, I couldn't shake the unsettling feeling that crept up my spine. My name is Kellen Blackhawk, and I was sent here on a mission by my superiors from the secret Native American special unit tasked with hunting down unexplained creatures terrorizing unsuspecting victims across the United States. My boots crunched on the shattered glass as I moved cautiously through crumbling corridors. It wasn't typical for me to have doubts about assignments, or my ability to handle them, but this time, it felt different. Maybe it was that eerie laughter echoing through the halls that made me question my choices. Peyton and Lonnie, two members of my unit, joined me on this mission. Peyton was a sharpshooter from South Dakota with confidence and a cheeky grin that irritated our foes, while Lonnie possessed a razor wit and encyclopedic knowledge of folklore. We moved carefully through endless hallways until we found ourselves in an old storage room filled with discarded industrial equipment. I could sense Lonnie's anxiety emanating from his quivering hands tightly gripping his sidearm. The room smelled musty, and faint copper taints lingered in the air. A sudden crunching noise pierced the silence as we climbed over debris towards a back area hidden in shadows. Tendrils of darkness seemed almost alive, dancing as if gleefully playing hide-and-seek. I wish I had never seen it, that grotesque monstrosity feasting upon something. At first glance, it seemed like a twisted amalgamation of the spinal cord and scorpion's tail entwined into a horrifying body with wickedly sharp claws attached to elongated arms. It reared back its segmented head, revealing hollow eye sockets and rows of razor-sharp teeth filling its gaping maw. Lonnie courted death by firing at the abomination. Bullets ricocheted off its hardened exoskeleton with each furious pull of the trigger. Bloodlust evidently boiled in its venomous blood as it lunged toward us. Our teamwork was impeccable as we executed evasive maneuvers. I fired at the creature, but my bullets seemed just as futile as Lonnie's. Peyton aimed carefully, judging the beast's movements before finding the perfect time to strike 
and he nailed a perfect shot. The creature let out an ear-shattering screech, which seemed to reverberate through our very souls. It writhed in agony before toppling into the recesses of an old industrial vat, its eerie laughter echoing through the abandoned space one last time. We stared in disbelief at our apparent victory, though it was temporary. Do you think it's over? Peyton asked cautiously. As I was about to answer, an odd glint caught my eye, darting in and out of the shadows high above us. The tension we felt hadn't eased. Instead, the monster's fall was the catalyst for an unnerving silence only broken by distant whispers and rustling fabric. Lonnie decided our best course of action would be to regroup and gather intel on this monster from ancient folklore we thought had long died. We knew it couldn't die by conventional means. As we retraced our steps back through mazes of corroded metal and darkened passageways, shuffling noises sounded from every direction. A cloying sense of dread stretched out gnarled fingers towards our trio like an enigmatic invitation to terror itself. Suddenly, dozens of wiry figures burst forth from previously hidden recesses frightening minions that were nothing more than wrangled appendages extending from clawed hands, quickly approached us in a bone-chilling frenzy. We scrambled to defend ourselves, but these minions moved too fast and too unexpectedly. Peyton fired at them, bringing some down while the rest advanced upon us, clawed hands slicing through the air. Lonnie tossed something to me, a flare from our supplies. I understood his plan and ignited it, casting a painfully bright light across the room. The minions recoiled in apparent agony and retreated back into the darkness, providing us a brief window of escape. As we sprinted through the twisted corridors, our hearts raced in fear, but we didn't dare pause to catch our breath or call for help. The factory's remote location meant backup would be hours away, and with every scream or scratch echoing through these haunting halls, it was clear we had become the hunted. Our only solace was finding temporary safe spaces to rest and hide, but they offered nothing more than a fleeting respite as we tried to avoid becoming yet another victim. During one such moment of uneasy stasis, Lonnie revealed that he had found a cryptic journal among the debris in an office earlier. It detailed disturbing experiments conducted here, combining human remains with unknown animalistic entities. He proposed that we destroy this factory to ensure no other innocents fall prey again. Collaboratively, we hatched a plan. Explosives strategically placed would collapse this monument of depravity upon itself. But for this gambit to work, we needed to lure our monstrous adversaries into the epicenter of the blast. Peyton took his position at a crucial junction near an exit while Lonnie and I set explosives all around the premises of the factory. While racing against time and unseen enemies that monitored our every move, we managed to get everything in place for detonation. With weary satisfaction crumbling under urgency's weight, I flipped a wall-mounted switch, filling halls with synchronized wreckage as metal crashed down amid eruptions of toxic vapors unleashed from crumbling containers. A monstrous cacophony of screeches and cries arose, signaling the fate of these loathsome entities. We scrambled to meet Peyton at the exit and dashed outside just as the entire factory caved in, burying our relentless pursuers beneath tons of twisted metal and debris. We paused at a distance to survey the destruction, each grasping that we had invited further danger by purposefully annihilating a cursed territory. As we stood amidst the smoky ruins, cold tendrils wormed their way around our hearts. Even without verbal confirmation, a mutual realization seized us. There would be terrible retribution for our actions. These creatures would send even more formidable opponents, now branded in vengeance's name. 
Lonnie's adamant voice cut through my thoughts. We need to leave now. We've done what we could here. Let's go somewhere safe and call in reinforcements. As we trudged away from the wreckage, I couldn't shake the feeling that our plight had not ended. The lingering sensation persisted that they would hunt us, melding into fragile lifelines and dragging us down into their nightmarish abyss. And as I later discovered from ancient myths passed down by my ancestors, only then did I realize the true nature of our enemy, a vengeful entity known as Tsulkalu, a beast made of flesh rooted in Native American folklore. The nightmare began as an experiment, but ultimately metamorphosed into something darker and more insidious than any human could comprehend or control. The autumn breeze rustled through the trees as I took my usual after-work stroll through the forest, a comfort that had become somewhat of a ritual for me. Although I'd spent countless years stalking supernatural creatures in my secret unit, protecting people from their bloodlust and violence, I still found solace in the woods. As a Native American, I felt a deep connection with these peaceful places where nature reigned. Walking alongside me was my trusted partner and best friend, Tala Silverman. We'd been on countless missions together, standing side by side against beings that most would regard as mere legends, but we knew better. We understood the dangerous reality of such beings, wendigos, shapeshifters, spirits, and more. I could feel Tala's uneasiness beside me as we walked further into the serene forest. Charlie, she whispered hesitantly. You ever wonder if there's more out there that we don't know about? Sometimes I wonder if even we've barely scratched the surface when it comes to these creatures. I might as well assume there is, I replied. Something hidden is tied to forgotten pieces of our lore. Our casual chat was suddenly interrupted by an unnatural screech echoing nearby, sending chills down my spine. The unease in Tala's expression morphed into fear as we exchanged glances. This doesn't sound like anything we faced before, she murmured. The wail grew louder and closer until it abruptly stopped. A row of trees swayed violently before being uprooted and thrown aside. Where those ancient trunks once stood rose a lanky figure mantled by darkness, an elongated humanoid shape with twisted limbs that looked like they were stitched together from other creatures' body parts. With blood-curdling shrieks reverberating around us, this mysterious creature darted towards us at a terrifying speed. Tala and I dove behind the still-standing trees, adrenaline surging through our veins as we fought back. We fired our guns at the monstrosity, but it barely flinched. Instead, it weaved between bullets and, as if on a whim, snatched Tala from behind the tree trunk. I sprinted after them, calling for her frantically. The creature turned on its heels quickly, grinning maliciously, its mouth a grotesque split in its face that revealed rows of jagged teeth. Do you like riddles, Hunter? The creature asked sinisterly. I'll give you one shot to save your friend. If you solve my riddle within the hour, I'll release her unharmed. If not, it let out a maniacal cackle that spoke volumes. I nodded warily feeling sweat trickling down my temple as I considered whether I could trust this being with Tala's life. What can be yours, but others use it more than you do? It questioned cryptically. My mind raced for an answer as I could hear Tala struggling in the beast's deadly grasp. Desperate to get her back alive and unarmed while comprehending that the creature must surely have connections to native folk legends that were beyond my knowledge, I stumbled against a wall of fear and anxiety. 
The nightmarish situation threatened to swallow me whole when suddenly a simple solution dawned upon me. Your name, I whispered. The answer was so obvious. The creature hissed in frustration but stayed true to its word. It hurled Tala towards me with such force that we both crashed into nearby trees. Unfazed by the stinging pain shooting across my limbs when they collided against the bark, I grabbed my gun and shouted our unit's haunting warning call. The forest swirled into utter chaos before our eyes. Leaves tossed around like confetti with unexpected gusts of wind while the sounds of struggle and confusion filled every inch of air. In the midst of it all, we locked eyes with that repulsive creature stalking us from the darkness and realized we were wading far deeper into the supernatural lore pond. Tala and I hobbled together, trying to escape from the creature's lair before time ran out on our bargain. It continued to haunt us from the shadows as an oozing presence pulsating with menace that clung tightly to our skin even when hidden briefly among ferns or ancient boulders lining rugged paths. As Tala and I escaped from the creature's lair, we knew calling for help would be futile. The creature didn't just target us. It seemed to have the ability to control and manipulate the forest itself. Any backup we'd call would likely face the same dangers, and even worse, since they wouldn't be familiar with this particular enemy. We stayed low, moving as quickly and quietly as possible, evading any ears or eyes that may be stalking us. The forest was a tactical advantage we could use to our favor but also a liability when faced with an unknown force. The days felt endless as we agonized over each step, avoiding the paths where gruesome evidence of prior victims lay. They were reminders of the creature's ruthless appetite. As we reached the edge of the woods, our paths crossed with a hiker who looked distraught. Their clothes were stained with blood that wasn't theirs. What happened? I asked cautiously. My friends, they're dead. He replied, choking on his words. It was something horrible. Twisted limbs and jagged teeth. It was undoubtedly our pursuer. It had reached them before they could escape, like us. We offered our condolences and asked if he had a phone, but it had been destroyed during his run for life. We helped him out of the woods and tried unsuccessfully to flag down any passing vehicles on the road. Neighbors had moved away over time due to inexplicable occurrences nobody could explain, leaving this area isolated. As night fell yet again, Tala and I reluctantly set up camp beside the road with our new companion. Uneasy sleep took hold amid the menacing, rustling foliage that edged closer as darkness deepened around us. Each noise in the night set my heart pounding faster than before. I knew we were still within its reach. Our new friend couldn't bear to see another full night consumed by terror. His relentless shouting aimed to draw it out, face it, and be done with it. Just leave us alone, he screamed repeatedly. But only a high-pitched laughter echoed back in response. By dawn's entrance, our companion had fled. His sanity had been compromised by the ordeal. It was almost as if the creature wanted us to remain trapped in its lair of torment. Perhaps it fed off our terror as much as our flesh. Tala and I decided to confront it head-on, our best chance at survival. We crafted makeshift weapons with available materials, though we knew they would fare little against the beast. At the very least, we'd go down fighting. As evening arrived, so did a thick fog that veiled our vision. Its arrival was announced by tortured howls closing in from every direction. Our nemesis had revealed itself, melting out of the shadows that consumed everything else. Its true form materialized before us like a final mockery of all the living creatures it had devoured 
a grotesque patchwork of stolen limbs and blood-caked fur. It neared with every jagged step across this desecrated ground. Tala struck first, her weapon lodged into its shoulder by relentless force. It reeled back in agony, shrieking violently in pain, a vile cacophony that assaulted our ears. It was wounded but still powerful enough to fight. The struggle was fierce and ugly, but we fought like cornered animals against this abomination that sought our demise. When suddenly Tala recognized a pattern in its movements, it reminded her of an ancient Wendigo legend from our people's history. The creature lunged one final time towards me, but I dodged just enough for my carefully aimed blow to slash open its throat. It staggered backward, choking on its own blood, as we watched it collapse onto the cold earth beneath us. Its dying breath formed an eerie phrase. I hungered for the souls of many, a new Wendigo born of the terror I've instilled. There I was, strolling through Maple Street's local park, when I noticed a peculiar, shimmering object near the bench I usually occupy during my break. My best friend Stephen, who worked in the same unit as me, approached from the opposite side of the park. Hey, Sam, he greeted me, flashing a grin. What's got your attention? I pointed toward the bizarre item on the ground and my curiosity peaked. Take a look at this. Stephen studied it for a moment before gasping, and I knew he shared my concerns. Such a shimmer was not an ordinary sight in Sunnyvale County. From that moment on, our mundane reality shattered to reveal something far more sinister. Far beyond what our secret Native American unit was equipped to handle, Except for tales handed down by our ancestors, frankly speaking, among all the folklore we had encountered as part of this special force tasked with hunting down and eliminating dangerous mythical creatures, nothing prepared us for what lay ahead. The clash between now and legend began with a series of grisly occurrences throughout the town. One morning, Bobby Larson found his beloved dog close to death behind his garage, battered and bruised in ways only human hands could have done. Why would someone do this to an innocent animal? He demanded while choking back tears when we arrived at his home. Steve sighed sympathetically. Bobby, I can't even imagine how awful this must be for you. His voice faded into nothingness as he realized the extent of pain our team's existence brought upon others like Bobby. It struck him deeply and lit up the guilt hidden behind his eyes. One after another, similar incidents plagued our community at an alarming rate, suggesting something sinister at work and stirring up chaos in equal proportions. Our ancestors spoke of blood-curdling cries piercing through the night's darkness like tormented whales heralding doom approaching, an omen bestowed by the shadow-dwelling creature who craved death and left devastation in its wake. Each time we confronted this heinous monster, our fruitless attempts to capture or kill it ended with scars marring our bodies and souls alike. Its sharp claws glistened under the stars marking my deepest nightmares. With each new battle, we grew more desperate. There was no denying that something was amiss. The balance between good and evil was tilting towards calamity, yet it still remained tilted towards resilience. Then the evening came when I finally faced it, its forked tongue flicking out from beneath blood-stained teeth as eyes reflecting terror bore into mine. The demon taunted us relentlessly, stricken with a sick sense of humor, as it revealed its wicked plans. Can't stop me. It rasped, drooling viscous fluids that sizzled against the ground. Nothing you do matters. The darkness will consume everything you hold dear. 
That fateful night eluded us once again. Our pursuit ended against a wall of savage fury, leaving destruction in its wake. We knew that our days were numbered. I knew my time had come to an end. Stephen attempted to reach out for me amidst smoke and debris as I darted back into the tormented world. But like before, we were never close enough to catch it or change fate. As the situation grew dire, Stephen and I knew we needed to protect ourselves. But calling for help seemed fruitless. People in our town would never believe that an ancient monster was roaming the streets, leaving behind horrifying acts of violence. Even if they did, what could they do against a creature that had defeated us time and time again? Overwhelmed by anguish for our fellow townsfolk and feeling a resolute sense of responsibility, we devised a plan to draw the creature away from town. If we couldn't stop it, we could at least lessen the harm it inflicted on those we cared about. Under moonlight, we ventured into the deep woods in hopes of luring the antagonist away from Sunnyvale County. Each step we took filled us with dread but also determination to keep our loved ones safe. As evening descended, we moved cautiously through the forest, acutely aware of any rustling or signs of movement. Suddenly, screams echoed all around us, agonized cries emanating from every direction. The creature was toying with us. Stephen grabbed my arm, his grip tense but steady. Sam, he whispered, fear palpable in his voice. We need to move now. We sprinted deeper into the heart of the woods while sounds of torment surrounded us like a nightmarish symphony. It felt as if even the trees themselves were bending towards our frenzied run. Out of breath and on edge, Stephen and I stumbled upon a decaying structure in a remote part of the forest, away from any human settlements. The horrific incidents in town had undoubtedly led us here, the final battleground where, one way or another, things would come to an end. With new resolve, we decided this was our last stand, drawing the monster here would ensure it would not be able to hurt anyone else outside of these woods. As darkness enveloped us completely, it attacked. Cat-like reflexes sent me flying into the dilapidated structure's crumbling wall, while Stephen cried out in agony as the creature descended upon him. The scene before me was gruesome, like a disturbing art piece depicting pain and suffering in excruciating detail. Blood coated the once mossy ground, and tendrils of dark mist slithered through the air like snakes seeking their prey. The time had come. Fight or flight kicked in. I somehow managed to grab a piece of broken wood, turning my fear into determination. Swinging wildly at the hulking mass of evil, I landed a solid blow to its side. It emitted an agonized screech, and for a moment, I thought we might buy some time. But my triumph was short-lived. In a flash, it retaliated with even more fierceness than before. Reality sank in as the truth revealed itself. Our assailant was not some nameless mythical creature out to destroy humanity. It was someone or something we knew. Someone who had walked amongst us in disguise, inflicting unimaginable pain and hiding in plain sight. With my last burst of strength, I pushed Stephen and myself deeper into the rickety structure in hopes of barricading ourselves from our foe. The twisted crying that echoed around us amplified our terror as we huddled together, clutching each other for dear life. Then suddenly, just when we thought our end had come, silence. The monster vanished as quickly as it appeared but left behind a horrifying scene that would forever haunt our memories. Our ordeal was over, for now. Maimed and beaten but still alive, Stephen and I stumbled back towards town to care for our wounds and lick our psychic scars. But one unanswered question lingered heavily over us. 
Who or what is this perverse embodiment of evil that took pleasure in tormenting us? Despite our valiant efforts to protect our town from further harm, we could not unmask the antagonists responsible for our devastation. Its true identity remained hidden, like a dark secret whispered from one twisted soul to another. The creature's cruel laughter haunted us, a chilling reminder that it was still out there, waiting, for what? We could only guess. As a government agent who specializes in the investigation and eradication of cryptids, I was no stranger to the strange. My Native American ancestry fueled my interest, and I was part of an elite squad of agents who dealt with these creatures. It was a gruesome job, but one that kept the public safe. My partner, Braxton Blackwater, and I were in northern Vermont for what we thought would be a simple werewolf case. We had tracked it for days, eliminating several victims from its path. But something was off about this creature. It was like nothing we had ever faced before. Just when we thought we had pinpointed its location, another wave of victims appeared, their bodies contorted and mangled like rag dolls. One victim was discovered hanging lifelessly from a tree limb by her own entrails. Another still had his eyes bulging out of his skull, seemingly frozen in agony almost as if he had been petrified mid-death. We knew we were dealing with something new, something beyond the realms of our understanding. Nights fell, and the sun set behind the dense forest that surrounded us as though trying to swallow us whole. That's when the otherworldly roar echoed through the trees, shaking the ground beneath our feet. Is that what you think? stammered Braxton. Whatever it is, it's not something we've encountered before, I replied, gripping my specially made silver blade knife tightly. Rushing through the forest, armed with senses honed by years of training, we moved cautiously toward the source of that ungodly sound. Suddenly we stumbled on her, bound to a tree trunk just off the dirt path where we stood. It seemed impossible that anyone could still be alive after going through such unimaginable torture, flayed skin hanging like ribbons from various points on her body and a head twisted around so far that it seemed as if her neck had snapped. It was only when Braxton's trembling fingers found her pulse did we confirm she still clung to life, just barely. The unlucky girl's muffled attempts to speak from her grotesquely contorted mouth sent another chill down my spine. In that moment, this once undefined and unknown monster took on a whole new meaning for us. Suddenly, the creature burst through the trees, its speed otherworldly. Its pale, hooked limbs clawed the air as it sprang toward us with a snarl. Braxton fired his weapon. The creature was knocked back but didn't seem harmed. I pounced and drove my blade into one of its limbs, causing it to recoil and screech. The sound reverberated violently in my head. Physical pain followed by temporary deafness was an unexpected side effect. The creature pulled back, astonished to encounter such resistance. Its bulbous eyes seemed to stretch forward from its misshapen skull as it analyzed us, a bizarre amalgamation of facial features that I couldn't shake. We continued our deadly dance, but the creature was agile and tactical, its pale skin seeming to blend in with the moonlight streaming through the trees. Every time we struck, it seemed unfazed. Whatever this beast was, it wasn't going down easy. After several minutes of grueling combat, I began to notice that the vile death screams of the creature, which had pierced our eardrums since we first encountered it, were taking on a tonal change. It was gaining strength again while we faltered. God help me! 
Braxton cried out as he unleashed a hail of fire from his shotgun at point-blank range. But just as quickly as he had made his move, so too did our foe leap into the darkness, leaving me with an agonizing decision, stay and attempt to save the girl, or pursue the monster and prevent it from causing more mayhem. I looked back at my partner, nearly crippled by fatigue and desperation. I knew I had to make a choice. I chose to pursue the creature, leaving Braxton behind to care for the injured girl. As I raced through the dark forest, my senses pushed to their limits, and I wondered if we were in over our heads. This thing was smarter and more resilient than anything we'd encountered before. The thought of calling for backup crossed my mind, but we were deep within the tangled woodland, far from any assistance. As I chased after the creature, careful not to lose sight of it in the moonlight, I noticed new tracks on the ground, violently clawed apart. The monster had brutally killed another human since our initial skirmish, further proof of its unfathomable speed and savagery. I stumbled upon the body of a young man who had suffered an excruciating demise. His face contorted in a silent scream, and his limbs twisted at unnatural angles. His stomach was shredded open, revealing insides that had been rearranged like a sick puzzle. The gruesome scene strengthened my resolve to stop this monster before it caused more terror and devastation. The chase continued with no end in sight. I began to fear that this thing was purposely leading me astray, forcing me deeper into the forest's dark embrace, where all manner of horrors could be waiting for me. In a shocking turn of events, I heard strategically placed explosives detonate, Braxton's doing, and watched as the creature staggered from the sudden concussive force. Weakened but still dangerous, the creature limped through a clearing as smoke filled the air. My heart pounded in my chest as I cornered it against a large rock formation. The creature glared at me with hatred-filled eyes. It opened its maw wide and spewed a vile substance onto the ground before taking off once again into the darkness. Confused but determined, I trudged on. There was no turning back now. The creature and I continued our desperate dance until we both could hardly stand. Its energy was fading, but so was mine, and I realized that we might both collapse before the end. As we locked eyes one final time, both of us battered and exhausted, I noticed a faint line on its forehead, an ancient hieroglyphic symbol. It was then that I remembered a folktale I had heard once before the story of an otherworldly creature born from a vile curse. Its very existence meant suffering and despair for anyone within its grasp. The spirit of an ancient malevolent entity trapped in the body of the grotesque beast in front of me I summoned my last ounce of strength and hurled my silver-bladed knife at the creature's throat. The monster snarled as blood oozed from the gash. It finally seemed to feel pain now. Unable to continue our battle but also unable to finish it, I stumbled backward into the darkness before collapsing into unconsciousness. As luck would have it, Braxton found me not long after, half buried beneath foliage at the edge of the forest. Knowing backup would be hours away given our remote location, he loaded me into our vehicle, and together, bloodied and bruised, we began our journey back to civilization. When asked if we'd finally killed the beast, I could only offer a solemn nod, either confirming nor denying if we had ended this nightmare. I've returned to where it all began on more than one occasion, searching for signs that the monster still lives or if our pursuit has brought an end to its bloody rampage. Yet part of me knows deep down that this is not over. An ancient curse as relentless as this one cannot die so easily. As long as people speak of its horror, it will continue to exist in some form. 
forever seeking victims to satisfy its demonic thirst for pain and suffering. I walked through the quiet, sleepy neighborhood of Elmwood, Illinois, as the street lights began to flicker on one by one. My steps echoed through the crisp autumn air, a testament to the otherwise silent surroundings. This region has a strange feel to it. Tales of unexplained events are whispered by locals and dismissed by skeptics. I never usually pay any mind to such stories. After all, in our line of work dealing with folklore creatures, hard facts mattered more than superstition. But something about this town made me uneasy. As a member of a secret Native American unit, speculating that I could call it the Watchers if I had to, I've encountered things many would think impossible. Using traditional knowledge from our ancestors, we hunted down the creatures that were the stuff of legends and protected humanity from the shadows. At work earlier today, Mason Greybird, another watcher, recounted an ominous account just before leaving our secret agency for home. Apparently, an unidentified body had washed up on the shore with signs that led me to think that it wasn't just any ordinary crime. As I navigated my way around dark corners and tricky turns, avoiding overgrown bushes and gnarled tree roots with agility and precision born of years of experience, all my senses seemed keenly attuned to my environment. While it's unlikely anyone would follow someone like me too closely, we were an unassuming but capable bunch. There was no room for carelessness in our line of work. As I turned the corner onto an unfamiliar street now devoid of streetlights, my entire body stiffened with alarm as an unbearable stench flooded through my nostrils. A wave of revulsion shuddered through me as I stepped closer to where the overpowering odor was emanating. That's when I saw it, a mass of tattered clothing adorned with human remains scattered unspeakably among discarded trash and the sickly sweet smell of decaying flesh. Even for a seasoned detective like myself, this sight was shockingly brutal in its cruelty. As I contemplated what my next move should be, I heard a low growling sound that seemed to surround the entire area. My eyes scanned the dark corners for any sign of movement, trying to overcome the panic rising inside me and focus on assessing the situation. Despite everything, I wanted nothing more than to call for backup a rarity in my line of work with its penchant for secrecy. But I knew that this nightmare needed only my intervention. The growling grew louder, accompanied by wet thuds and clicking, until I caught a glimpse of silvery scales glinting in the dim light just a few yards away from me. Acting quickly, I dodged behind one of the larger dumpsters as an abomination emerged from the dark depths into the failing light. A face twisted with shards of bone jutting out at unnatural angles once had a human visage. Its bulk glistened with seeping fluids whose origin was best not thought about. What type of folklore creature was this supposed to go up against? This grotesque beast had carved its grim territory here in our world, claiming innocent lives and transforming them into unrecognizable horror. As it stepped closer for inspection or perhaps feasting, sniffs quivering about in the air to catch any fleeing prey, my determination surged inside me to send it back from whence it came. I steadied my breath, slowly inching backward to put more distance between me and the monstrous creature. I knew I couldn't fight this thing on my own, nor could I contact my fellow watchers without putting them in direct danger. The practicality of secrecy in our line of work at times like these seemed more like a curse. My mind raced as I looked for a way out, every muscle in my body ready to spring into action if needed. 
My thoughts briefly considered calling the local authorities but quickly dismissed it. They would be unprepared and unequipped to handle such an unfathomable threat. Instead, I focused all my energy on survival. As the creature sniffed around, I scanned the area for something, anything, that could be used as a weapon or an escape route. The street was lined with old brick buildings, their windows intact but dark, giving an eerie sense of being watched. I spotted what looked like a lock service door in one of the buildings a few yards away from me. It took all my willpower not to launch into a sprint, knowing any sudden movement could draw attention to myself. As quietly as possible, I moved toward it, praying that it'd make minimal noise when forced open. The beast had moved further away from me now, seemingly unaware of my presence as it continued its morbid search among the remains it had created. As I finally reached the door, Relief washed over me for just a fleeting moment before giving way to dread once again. Unlocking this without tools might take too long and increase the risk of getting caught. Due to the urgency of escaping this life-threatening situation, reluctantly and against better judgment, I decided to call a fellow watcher for assistance. Only someone from our ranks would be able to grasp the severity. Clenching my teeth in fear and frustration, I whispered into my communication device, Grey Bird, help! Elmwood! Suddenly, the creature stopped and turned its head toward me, seeming to have sensed my contact. Panic quickened my pulse, and I attempted to hide in the recess of a nearby alley. It was too late. It had spotted me and let out an ear-splitting screech, Though desperately wanting to run, I froze. That was the last thing I remember before everything went black. When I came, I found myself in a dimly lit room, surrounded by the concerned faces of fellow watchers. Grey Bird spoke first when he sensed my confusion. We got here as fast as we could. The creature vanished right before we arrived. As realization dawned on me, I felt an odd mixture of relief and uneasiness wash over me. While others started to discuss the situation and our next move, I couldn't help but feel haunted by the memory of that grotesque beast, the embodiment of living nightmares. Though we could not name it yet nor entirely understand its origin, I knew deep down that it wouldn't be our last encounter with this ungodly creature. Only in the days to come did we learn of its existence as part of an ancient lineage, a being spawned from darkness itself on a twisted mission of creating chaos and fear among humanity. That knowledge would weigh heavily on all of us who had looked into the eyes of true terror. My name is Jack Two Feathers, and I've been part of a secret Native American unit for years, tasked with hunting down and killing the dangerous creatures of folklore. My team consisted of eight fellow Native American hunters, each selected for their exceptional skill and dedication to protecting our people. It was an unusually calm afternoon, and I was assigned a new case. Reports had been filtering in about a surge of unexplainable deaths in a small rural town. The local police were baffled, and the corpses of the victims had horrifying injuries, beyond any explanation grounded in reality. As our unit gathered around the conference table at our hidden headquarters, Samantha Red Cloud shared her insights on the peculiar scratches on every door in that little town. It's as if some monstrous claw was dragging against them. Our team mobilized immediately. We reached the desolate town under the guise of an investigation squad specializing in homicides. We didn't want to alert the locals to the true nature of their adversary. We split into groups of three to cover as much ground as possible, 
hoping to discover evidence about this enigmatic creature. The sound of an agonizing scream broke through our conversations just a few hours after we arrived at our designated locations. Quick! yelled Andrew Silvereye, one of my teammates. We have to move swiftly yet quietly. Let's trace that scream! As we ran towards where the cry originated, we found Samantha with James Wind Walker kneeling by a bloodied, lifeless body. Clearly, the victim was attacked mere moments ago. While James contacted the rest of the team, Sally Greenwood inspected the body closely. This is worse than I thought, she whispered through her trembling voice. The victim was bloodied and mutilated beyond recognition, their face torn off and limbs severed, with entrails scattered all around them. The bracing sight infuriated us all. We had to find this creature and stop it from doing further harm. As I stood up, I spotted something out of the corner of my eye, a swift movement near an abandoned warehouse. With my heart in my throat, we cautiously made our way towards it. We held our weapons tightly, prepared to face this heinous beast. The warehouse door creaked as Andrew carefully pushed it open. What in the... He whispered in horror upon witnessing the scene before us. The warehouse was filled with half-eaten carcasses of unknown victims. A nauseating smell wafted through the air. Guts and viscera were everywhere. The creature had been using this area as its feeding grounds, hiding its gruesome collection here. Just then, we heard a low growl coming closer and closer. This sinister creature finally emerged from the shadows, its grotesque appearance seared into our memories forevermore. Standing at over seven feet tall, it had three heads filled with razor-sharp teeth dripping with blood. Scales coated its body, giving off a sickening shimmer under the dim light. It looked like no other creature we've ever encountered. Before we could react... Out of nowhere surged Clarence Iron Horse. Armed with a flaming torch and the ferocity we all knew about, he lunged at the monster. Take cover! He screamed, engaging in a deadly struggle with this beast straight out of our darkest nightmares. The fight was intense. Every second that passed felt like an eternity. As the creature lashed out towards Clarence, he managed to stab a sharp knife into one of the beast's heads unexpectedly. A guttural whimper escaped the monster as its rage intensified exponentially. In response to Clarence's efforts, Andrew launched an arrow directly into one of the remaining heads of this nightmarish entity, causing it to stagger back momentarily. But as frighteningly resilient as it was relentless, it continued making its advance on us. It seemed that no matter what weapons and tactics we employed against it, this ghastly creature was not defeated. We were growing weary, and our team was beginning to falter. Clarence's quick wit was growing relentless as well. All right, you vile beast. As long as I stand, none of my brothers or sisters will perish before you. The warehouse erupted in chaos as we fought with unity an unwavering determination to protect our team and the innocent people in the town. With each new attack the creature unleashed upon us, we matched it with equal force and tenacity. Seeing the rest of our team being overpowered and on the verge of defeat, I made a quick but difficult decision. Everyone, retreat! We need to call for reinforcements, I commanded. At first, no one wanted to leave their teammates behind, but we knew that if we didn't get help, the town and our unit might be lost forever. As we made our way from the gruesome warehouse scene, we heard the agonizing screams of Clarence and some of our other teammates, whose fates were sealed by this merciless creature. Our hearts weighed heavy with grief as we put some distance between us and the besieged battlefield. 
We had no choice but to seek help. All right, I said with frustration once I thought we were safely away from the mayhem. It's time to call in reinforcements. This creature won't be taken down by just one unit. With decisive haste, our team started placing calls, activating encoded radios used explicitly among our secret society of Native American hunters. Desperate for assistance, our voices carried far and wide across our secured communications network. But something about this situation was extremely odd. Scanners showed no signs of such a ferocious creature existing in ancient folklore or modern times. Despite countless records spanning centuries of monsters and beings, nothing bore any resemblance to the beast that had ruthlessly attacked us today. While waiting for reinforcements to arrive, I poured over texts that chronicled phantasmal entities native to various regions. There had to be something there, a clue to tell us how to defeat this monster. As reinforcements arrived at our side faster than expected due to the urgency in our voices, we filled them in with the gruesome details about what happened at the warehouse. The bloodied battle scene weighed heavily on every mind present, from experienced hunters to fresh newcomers alike. Closing my eyes to keep my focus while relaying these distressing details, something felt eerily wrong with my surroundings. Despite the increasing number of our allies on the scene, it dawned on me that all these overpowering nightmarish events transpired in a suspiciously well-orchestrated manner almost like we were being lured into a sinister trap. Paul, another member of our team who specialized in historical research, mentioned his suspicions while digging through old texts. There might be someone behind this. He whispered to me, careful not to alert others until we had clear information. Together, Paul and I retreated to a quiet corner of our makeshift base to discuss our hunch. We spoke in hushed tones. If there were indeed a culprit possessing knowledge of our methods and using this creature against us, it followed that they must hail from within our inner circle. Suddenly, realizing we had no time to waste in tracking down this potential mastermind, we rashly decided to venture into the warehouse lair once again. The creature may hold crucial information about its elusive master. Our team, now greater in number than before and better prepared against evil forces, crept back toward the warehouse where the violent confrontation initially took place. Upon cautiously entering the vile-smelling feeding ground, my heart dropped as I saw human remains shredded beyond recognition, the remnants unmistakably of some fallen teammates who dared try to take down the creature. Though filled with unbearable rage and pain at witnessing more lives snuffed out by this unspeakable horror, we forced ourselves to focus on one task, capturing or destroying the creature and finding conclusive evidence about its human controller. After searching meticulously through seemingly endless piles of bloody talons and scales shed off during earlier battles, I stumbled upon an undeniable piece of evidence bearing both horror and proof that our own trusted kin bore responsibility for these abominable atrocities, a single talon clutching a note left by its creator. Locked beneath centuries of secrecy and dark magic, an age-old feud within our tribe had spawned a bitter traitor crafting this demonic creature as ultimate revenge, the Guadani. As I walked through the dimly lit hallway, I felt a sudden chill grab hold of my body. I shivered, recalling the gruesome scene in the abandoned house we discovered earlier that day. My partner, Kia Whitestone, and I had just wrapped up our most recent job in our unit, specializing in eliminating vile folklore creatures. 
There had been whispers of brutal and unnatural deaths in a small town on the outskirts of Massachusetts for some time now. Our investigation led us to an eerie old house described by locals as cursed. We entered cautiously. Each room was filled with thick layers of dust and decaying furniture. Suddenly, Kia signaled for me to stop when we reached what appeared to be an old dining room. The air was filled with a suffocating stench. It took all my willpower not to vomit. In front of us were the remains of three people, two adults and a teenager, sitting at the table. It looked like they had been mutilated beyond recognition, their crushed bones scattered around like confetti. The perpetrator had left a horrific sight for us to find. Who could have done this? Kia asked with a shaky voice. Her eyes looked haunted, as if she had seen otherworldly horrors, and that was coming from someone who was used to dealing with the monstrous world that hid behind our mundane lives. While examining the surroundings, we found no evidence of any known creature within our database taking responsibility for this depravity. It seemed like we were facing something darker and more mysterious than anything we'd dealt with before. As night fell upon us, we decided to gather more intel about the creature from the locals while keeping guard over the town. Around 3 a.m., I sat alone in my patrol car, feeling exhausted from lack of sleep and questioning why this always seemed to be how our operations transpired. Suddenly there came a faint voice calling from outside my windows. It sounded like a child's whimper. I grabbed my flashlight, shining it in all directions, hoping to find the source. What I saw was something unlike anything I've ever encountered a distorted figure with elongated limbs and jagged teeth. Its oversized, hollow eyes met mine, and it froze as if studying me. Before I could react or call Kia for backup, it pounced toward me with inhuman speed. I fumbled for my gun, but the creature knocked it out of my hand before I could reach for it. I dodge its sharp claws and open the car door to provide some form of protection between us. There's no way for me to call Kia right now without risking my own life. The creature resumed its attack, lunging at me while swiping and gnashing its teeth. I give it my best guess that this abomination must be the antagonist responsible for the grotesque killings we found earlier today. The battle continued on with no escape. I struggled to remember the self-defense training we've gone through countless times. I managed to pull out a knife from my pocket, cutting its forearm as it tries to grasp my throat. Black ichor oozes from the wound. The creature recoils momentarily as Kia's sudden voice calls out to me on our radio. Kia's voice distracted the creature for a moment buying me enough time to kick it away and scramble to my feet. Kia, I'm under attack. There's a thing outside my patrol car. What? She yelled back over the radio, sounding alarmed. Stay where you are. I'm coming. Not enough time, Kia. I replied while dodging another swipe of the creature's claws, desperately searching for an escape route. In that brief moment of focus, I noticed more people emerging from their homes to see what was causing the commotion, citizens who could also fall victim to this monster. Go help evacuate the town, Kia. This thing is extremely dangerous. Mobilize anyone who can help. I ordered while sprinting through an alley. Kia reluctantly agreed and began alerting nearby units as well as instructing the townspeople to evacuate as fast as they could. This creature couldn't be allowed to hurt anyone else. As I ran through the town, I urged some of them to immediately leave their homes and stay away from whatever was hunting them down. Injured, tired, and without any backup, I decided my best strategy was to stay ahead of the monstrous creature in pursuit of me until reinforcements arrived. 
by leading it further away from civilians and keeping it preoccupied with me rather than others, I hoped we'd be able to buy enough time for everyone else to safely evacuate. The agonizing chase continued on for what seemed like hours, through houses, over fences, and across darkened streets, until my stamina dwindled. My legs ached, and sweat poured down my face as I barely managed to evade another swipe from the creature's deadly claws. Within a few moments of rest in a boarded-up house near the outskirts of town, I heard the sound of sirens in the distance. Help must be arriving. Remaining concealed within the house's shadows while catching my breath, the creature was searching through alleyways, and within the houses, I could hear its disturbingly heavy breathing. Sirens wailed throughout the town as emergency personnel arrived, with Kia leading them. They began to corner, capture, and subdue the elusive creature while paramedics treated injuries sustained by both me and others who hadn't been successful in escaping the creature's wrath. As I was tending to them, I couldn't help but reflect on all of those we'd failed to save. I knew it would be a long road toward recovery for both myself and the survivors who had lost their families. Once it was finally captured, the creature was unveiled as an abomination created by unethical scientific experiments, a grotesque fusion of human and animal DNA. The cruel researchers hoped to invent an unstoppable killing machine. They had succeeded but lost control over their own creation in the process. My name is Lao Bywater, a jaded but skilled agent of the secret unit. We're an elite team of Native Americans tasked with tracking down and eliminating threats born from folklore. I have seen my fair share of horrors, but the one case that still haunts me is the one I never saw coming. It was a dreary evening when I received a call from my colleague, Jay Stevens, another member of our unit. He was out investigating a lead on an unlikely creature sighting. Lyle, I need you to come down to the boatyard. Things are worse than we expected, Jace told me, urgency tinging his voice. What's going on? I queried, already gathering my gear. There was an incident involving fishermen and their crew. Just hurry, he said before hanging up. As I reached the boatyard, I took in the gruesome scene before me. Bodies were strewn about, torn, and mutilated in unimaginable ways. The blood-spattered deck made it all too apparent that whatever attack these men had no regard for mercy. Jace met me at the scene with a somber expression. What are we dealing with? I asked myself for the answer. We're not certain yet. Jace confessed. But it has mutilating capabilities beyond anything we've ever encountered. There was no time to lose. Utilizing our investigative skills, we canvassed the area for clues and eyewitnesses who might have seen something unusual or sinister leading up to this massacre. Wallace! called out Trisha Longshadow, another comrade from our secret unit. She beckoned us over toward a trembling man huddling behind some crates. This man saw what happened. She explained gently as Wallace fought back violent sobs. What did you see? Lyle asked Wallace, pressing for information while ensuring his safety. Between gasps for air and desperate tears, the man began to recount his horrific encounter. It appeared out of nowhere a monstrous beast. I haven't ever seen anything like it. The men didn't stand a chance. In the course of the investigation, we began to unmask our perpetrator, an enigmatic creature rumored to devour humans with its razor-sharp claws and teeth. 
Word had reached us about a mysterious entity that had been sighted in various places throughout the United States. The crimes left in its wake were heinous and unthinkable, leaving a trail of death and mayhem, much like the scene we were facing. With each new witness account, our conviction only grew stronger that this monstrous being was the source of all that bloodshed. Although baffled by this elusive creature's origin, we pondered whether it was a living embodiment of an ancient evil or some shape-shifting entity born from twisted alchemy. But regardless of where it came from or why it had entered our world, one thing was clear. It needed to be stopped before more lives were claimed. Together with my team, we devised a plan to trap the creature on its hunting grounds. We used bait to lure it into an abandoned warehouse, where we surrounded it from every angle. It snarled and snapped at us with its ghastly features, distorting unnaturally as though challenging us for daring to cross its path. Using specialized ammunition designed to pierce through even supernatural defenses, Jace and I opened fire with precise aim not bearing the thought of this monster running rampant any longer. Smoke filled the warehouse as the creature writhed and howled in pain. As it crashed through walls and equipment, we struggled to keep up with its erratic movements. With each shot, the monster grew angrier and more violent, making it evident that we couldn't defeat it through force alone. Despite our best efforts, we couldn't contain the creature or protect ourselves from its deadly onslaught. One by one, our teammates were taken down, their bodies mutilated beyond recognition, just like the fishermen that brought us to this nightmare. Jace and I knew that we couldn't call for backup as long as this monster was alive. It would only lead to more casualties among our people and there was no guarantee that reinforcements would even be able to reach us in time given the remoteness of the warehouse. Helpless against the creature's ferocity, it soon became clear that our only option was to escape. We sprinted towards a side door leading outside of the warehouse. However, in our haste and fear, we didn't notice Trisha was several paces behind us. She let out a blood-curdling scream as claws pierced her chest and yanked her back into the shadows. The door slammed shut behind us, cutting off her cries for help. The reality of our situation made me realize that facing this monster wasn't about heroics. It was about survival. Jace and I could only hope that we had inflicted enough damage to buy us some time before it decided to hunt us down again. We stumbled through the surrounding forest, desperately hoping our unit headquarters would come into view with every turn. Our bodies ached from exhaustion as we began to accept the possibility that we might never find our way home. Suddenly, Jay spotted a weak flicker of light in the distance. Following it cautiously but urgently, we finally reached our unit headquarters, battered and bloodied. Without delay, Jays relayed the night's events and our failed attempts at capturing the creature to our unit commander. Plans were quickly set in motion to organize a search and rescue team for Trisha, though I knew deep down that there was little hope of finding her alive. New strategies were discussed to protect future victims and figure out ways to confront the creature once more. As I sat in our briefing room, my thoughts returned to what had transpired. Unable to grasp how everything went so terribly wrong, I recalled Wallace's testimony of the ruthless beast attacking the fishermen at the boatyard. In his description, something suddenly clicked that had not occurred to me earlier. The way it appeared on the scene, its vicious capabilities, Everything pointed not towards a mythological creature but rather towards a carefully disguised human perpetrator. The thought sent shivers down my spine and horrified me more than any monster I had ever encountered. We were dealing with a highly intelligent and skilled individual who could manipulate 
and blend into society without suspicion, someone who had been hunting us from within all along. The true killer was no monster born of folklore, but one among us, a fellow human being. I had never really paid much attention to the hushed conversations that swirled among my quirky, secretive co-workers. I am a pretty skeptical person and never thought twice about their insistence on the existence of enigmatic creatures roaming our world. So, imagine my initial dismissal when I was assigned to a special mission with them. Since I can remember, protecting others has been core to my identity. Ironically, that's how I found myself working within this top-secret Native American society known as the League. Our main focus was usually on environmental preservation, and for the most part, we were successful at it. That's why, when the mission came up involving a folklore creature running amok in the Everglades, I thought it was just a diversion tactic. Raised by a strict military father and an elementary school teacher mother in Tucson, Arizona, I struggled growing up trying to balance my natural desire for order and my rebellious attitude toward conformity, not to mention constantly confiscating my classmates' snacks. We were well acquainted with traditional Native American legends and revered them deeply, but they were always just that, legends. On the first day of our mission in Florida, we received sporadic reports about mutilated animals near residential areas bordering the Everglades. My team and I scoured each crime scene meticulously, searching for clues or patterns. These incidents seemed eerily deliberate. Each case left us more perplexed until one morning, while hunching over another brutal scene, one of my team members piqued my curiosity. What if it's real? My father had often asked me this question as a joke during our childhood visits to the reservation. I scoffed at first, but felt some boundaries shatter as more evidence began to pile up that pointed towards something supernatural lurking in the swamp's depths. It didn't take long before. What if it's real? seemed like a plausible theory. As our investigation progressed, I couldn't shake the sensation that the beast we were chasing mirrored a fabled creature my great-grandmother had once described, one that, when wronged, adroitly and silently claimed the lives of humans with chilling precision. The marshy landscape was dizzying yet awe-inspiring. Time seemed to lose its meaning as day merged seamlessly with night. The cacophony of sounds from a myriad of creatures filled the air, amplifying the oppressive tension that had already weighed upon us. We didn't have much in terms of visible evidence, apart from footprints, for what our quarry looked like. From the accounts and descriptions gathered so far, I gathered it was humanoid but with an alarming degree of agility and skill at evasion. We had decided to set up camp in a clearing next to an old abandoned hunting cabin. Around the makeshift fire pit, our conversations meandered amid half-hearted banter and grim discussions about what kind of supernatural being might be behind these attacks. It was during this time that someone told a joke about a man who wore his pants too tight leading to an ill-fated encounter with a wild boar. It broke some of our dark mood before plunging back into grim contemplation. The next several days proved fruitful but frustrating. We walked through knee-deep mud and crossed treacherous marshlands with only occasional glimpses of our monstrous foe. But it became indubitably clear this was no ordinary adversary. At night, my teammates and I would huddle around a crackling fire, sharing stories of past encounters with folklore. Monsters, feeling somewhat grateful for the camaraderie of facing such apprehension and unease together. 
Our team's determination never waned as we pursued every lead with alternating confidence and trepidation. We painstakingly tracked the beast's movements through dense quagmires before catching sight of something that left us reeling. Distorted human remains intertwined within the roots of a massive tree. The sight was a stark reminder of exactly what we were up against. Chilled to the core, I knew in my bones there was no turning back now. If this thing, this monster, had existed for centuries and had already taken countless lives, then we were duty-bound to put an end to its reign of terror. The next day, we received another report of mutilated animals near residential areas bordering the Everglades. We gathered our gear, hoping to catch a glimpse of the creature behind the attacks. We followed the trail of destruction left by the monster as its attacks on animals gave way to humans. The victims seemed to share a common trait. They were usually outdoors and often alone when the creature struck. As we investigated each scene, we began piecing together evidence about the habits and abilities of our foe. We identified that it was most active during twilight hours and mainly attacked from behind overwhelming its prey with violent force. Its lethal precision led us to believe it possessed heightened senses, possibly using echolocation or thermal vision for navigation. Our efforts to study this creature consumed us. Even our sleep was tormented by uneasy dreams filled with otherworldly forms hidden just beyond our comprehension. Despite our obsession, we couldn't escape a gnawing feeling of being watched. Though it remained elusive and out of reach, the knowledge that this unknown predator stalked us made every step in the swamp feel more treacherous. Despite realizing we could be targets ourselves, we couldn't call for help as doing so might reveal sensitive information about our society and mission weapons. Our unique responsibility urged us to see this through alone. One evening, while trudging through the muck, we heard an agonized scream just ahead of us. Heart pounding, fearful for what we would find, we rushed towards it to confront the menace directly at last. We arrived to find one of our own team members sprawled on the ground, barely clinging to life. His injuries were extensive and it was clear he wouldn't survive much longer. In his final moments, he managed to choke out a description of his attacker, a monstrous humanoid figure with razor-sharp claws that could rend flesh from bones effortlessly. There was no time for mourning, as fear transformed into determination. We equipped ourselves with specialized weapons and set a trap for the creature, hoping to wound or incapacitate it. To maximize our chances of success, we placed whatever defense constructs we had at our disposal around the perimeter. The trap was set, and all that remained was to wait, trying our best to ignore the tension gnawing at our collective resolve. Hours later, a gut-wrenching howl pierced the stillness surrounding us. All senses were heightened, with excitement and terror coursing through our veins in equal measure. It was now or never. We braced ourselves as the ground beneath us trembled from the monstrous creature's approach. As it lunged out of the darkness towards one of us, we sprang into action. Employing tactics we hoped would capitalize on its size and speed, we attacked in coordinated strikes designed to wound without causing fatal harm. There could be no mistaking what this creature was. Our plan worked as it got entangled in our web of traps and stumbled briefly. However, its recovery was swift. The creature countered with such ferocity that few managed to step back before they were severely injured. We barely held our ground, sustaining heavy losses while trying desperately to defeat this nightmarish enemy. Despite being severely outnumbered and cornered, the beast gave a last defiant snarl before it made its escape into the depths of the Everglades. 
as we assessed our remaining team members' condition and tended to those still alive. A mix of relief and despair enveloped all within its cold embrace. The sober revelation soon came. We might have won this battle but have only uncovered a small glimpse into something far more sinister than any legend we knew. In retrospect, I am now convinced this monster had indeed stalked us all along. Everything fits with the stories told by my great-grandmother about a vengeful creature from Native American lore called Wendigo. Our mission objective had become clear. Restore balance by securing the survival of our people and ridding the world of this ancient monster. But for now, that elusive foe lurks somewhere out there, biding its time and fueling nightmares that haunted us each night. There I lay on my lumpy mattress in the overcrowded boarding house, trying to catch some sleep after a tiring day at work. The frigid wind rattled the loose window pane, but the place was certainly a refuge from the life I had been living. As the newest member of a clandestine team of Native Americans tasked with confronting sinister folklore entities, I never thought my life would take such an extraordinary turn. And yet, here I was, Lucas Manigotes, hailing from a small Arizonian town, thrust into this world of pervasive darkness. My ragtag group of hunters consisted of Max Yellowbird, our wise but grouchy leader, Fiona Glidesonwind, our surveillance expert and munitions specialist, and Jedediah Wounded Knee, a muscular brute who could bring down a creature with his bare hands. A dog's sharp bark echoed in the distance as I tossed and turned. It seemed like quiet slumber wouldn't find me tonight. Moments after giving up on sleep, an urgent knock on the door jolted me into alertness. Fiona barged in without waiting for me to respond. Her eyes wide and shocked as she said breathlessly, You need to see this, now? We moved quickly toward Max's room at the end of the poorly lit hallway. Upon entering, we were greeted by Jedediah cleaning his bowie knife with silent intensity. They made space for me as I peered down at Max's laptop screen. What I saw was gruesome. A home video had surfaced online of people being viciously mauled by an unseen force in a small Kentucky suburb truly disturbing and unexplainable. Jedediah swore under his breath while Fiona seemed to be fighting back tears. It was clear we needed to investigate this new case immediately. Our team couldn't stand idly by when innocent lives were at stake. After packing our gear and loading up the unmarked black van, we informed our superiors of our plan and hit the road. The journey was long, dark, and heavy with anticipation. As we drove through the muddy country roads of Kentucky later that evening, Fiona jokingly spoke up. Hey, Lucas! How many crypto hunters does it take to screw in a light bulb? Unable to come up with a witty response, I replied. I don't know how many. Just one, she smirked but good luck getting Max to admit he's afraid of the dark. We all laughed nervously while Max gave her a half-hearted frown. Trying to keep spirits high was essential. We knew too well that our upcoming encounter with whatever villainous entity awaited us would likely be anything but amusing. Max pulled the van into a dirt driveway and killed the engine. We found ourselves situated in front of a dilapidated farmhouse where the maulings were said to have occurred. As we cautiously approached the house under the moon's muted glow, a chill ran down my spine, and an overpowering sense of dread fell upon me. But this was no time for hesitation. Lives depended on our courage. The creaky front door reluctantly yielded to Jedediah's forceful push. Stepping inside, 
I could still catch the fading scent of lingering fear mixed with rusted iron. The crimson stains smearing the walls testified to the horrors that took place. Suddenly, an unearthly howl filled every corner of the room with paralyzing dread. Staggering back from its source, a grotesque mass shrouded in darkness, I could see its shape begin slithering toward us. Viper-like tendrils undulated menacingly in our direction as Max yelled out, Hang on! I've got an idea! Lucas, throw me that flare you packed! As I hastily tossed it to him, he lit it up and swung with every ounce of his strength, sending the fiery ember straight into the writhing mass. A cacophony of otherworldly shrieks accompanied the fiend's frantic thrashing as it withdrew from the blaze. Just as I felt a fraction of hope take seed in my chest, I suddenly found myself pinned against the wall by a vast and chilling appendage that had shot out from the shadowy figure. I struggled to break free from the chilling grip of the appendage, but my efforts were in vain. Jedediah and Fiona tried to pull me free, but the creature was unrelenting. Max, still determined to rescue me, searched frantically for anything that could help. While I gasped for breath, Max spotted a canister of gasoline and an old lighter nearby. He doused the floor surrounding the creature with gasoline and lit it on fire. The room erupted in a blazing inferno, forcing the monstrous being to retract its appendage from me as it recoiled from the flames. As we scrambled away from the burning house, I realized we had no choice but to call for help or risk facing this horror without any backup. I dialed our superiors and quickly relayed what had happened. They instructed us not to engage with the creature any further and promised to dispatch a specialized team immediately. Without any other options, we waited at a safe distance and watched as firefighters arrived to control the blaze. By the time they had extinguished it completely, all that remained was a charred shell of what once housed unspeakable evil. For days afterward, we lived on high alert, wondering whether the creature had been destroyed or was still lurking nearby. Relief came only when our superiors informed us that their team had extracted a lifeless mass from the debris and confirmed it matched our descriptions. No murders had been reported during those days either. As we prepared to leave Kentucky and return home, our superiors gave us one last piece of information, something even they couldn't fully comprehend. The creature our team faced was believed to be an ancient chindi, an evil spirit conjured from rage and violence over many lifetimes. Though we had managed to fend off this gruesome villain this time, its existence was a reminder that we could never truly escape the darkness in this world. The thought was both sobering and motivating, a testament to the importance of our team's work. It seemed that in every corner, we would indeed find more than meets the eye. The mosquito buzzed past my ear, and I swatted it away with an exaggerated flinch. It was another hot, sweaty day in the dense forest, and even the breeze seemed to hesitate in these parts. The team and I trekked further into the wilderness, the complaints piling up alongside our exhaustion. You know what would have been useful, grunted Jack, one of my teammates, as he adjusted the strap of his bag. If they'd given us one of their fancy cooling vests instead of these sweating bags, don't complain too much, I replied. At least we're getting a nice workout for free. Jack rolled his eyes at me and dove under a low-hanging branch. This was our team of special agents within a secret unit that hunted down mysterious folklore creatures plaguing unsuspecting people around the United States. Don't get me wrong, 
Most of our targets were small animals and spirits that could be handled safely. However, now and then, we would encounter something we hadn't bargained for or didn't recognize. Our mission on this particular venture had been quite simple at the outset. Locate and neutralize an unknown creature that left a mess within a nearby village's livestock pen. When the first reports became known, none of us anticipated the aftermath we would discover. As we approached the site where it had first been spotted, my heart raced in anticipation. Despite hours in the forest, none of us were prepared for what was waiting for us. From afar, it almost looked like one of those classic Halloween decorations you'd see in front yards during October. A gaunt figure hunched over with long limbs splayed out like some dark deity. Yet, as we drew closer, reality began to sink in with each step. This creature wasn't an ordinary mythological beast seen in our line of work. This being stood tall on two legs while its elongated arms dripped with a thick substance that seemed to coat its entire body. Hollow black eyes seemed to stare straight into my soul as it bared its jagged teeth at us. It was clear this creature had no intention of leaving. It had found its prey. And now, we were face to face with something I'm not sure even the rest of our team was aware of. Despite the initial paralysis that had overtaken us all, I quickly realized that we needed to act fast. What was happening in this forest wasn't up for discussion. Form up! I shouted, snapping everyone back into focus. We moved, positioning ourselves for a strategic assault on this bizarre foe. My team and I got in formation, weapons ready, and laser focused on this nightmarish entity before us. Swallowing the lump in my throat, I gave the signal to fire. An explosive barrage of bullets whizzed through the air as we aimed to put an end to this atrocity. To our shock and horror, though, the creature seemed almost resilient to each bullet's impact, barely even flinching at times. Fall back! I yelled as loudly as possible, beads of sweat dropping from my furrowed brows. Our struggle became more desperate with each moment as our opponent lunged forward with striking speed. Brushing away a trickle of blood from a fresh cut just above my eyebrow, I caught sight of the creature pinning Jack to the ground, a guttural sound shrieking from its throat. Panic surged through me as its blood-slickened hands raised high up into the air. Against every instinct screaming within me, I charged forward without thinking, an act born out of pure adrenaline and unfiltered fear for my teammate's life. With the creature's focus on Jack, I bolted into action, using my tactical knife to slash its arm with a swift, precise movement. Momentarily stunned and pained, the creature recoiled just enough for me to pull Jack away from its grasp. Everyone, retreat now! We're outmatched! I commanded as we began our hasty retreat deeper into the forest. As we ran, I glanced back to see the creature marred by my blade. It let out a screech that resonated through the trees. For a moment, I thought we might have bought ourselves some precious time. Call for backup! I shouted over to another teammate, hoping that reinforcements could better handle whatever we had just encountered. However, my teammate's attempt at reaching our headquarters proved fruitless. Our communications gear had been damaged during the confrontation. We're cut off, they reported grimly. Having no choice but to push forward without reinforcements, our team made its way through an almost labyrinthine section of the forest as the creature pursued us relentlessly. There was no place for us to hide or catch our breath. We could only hope our evasive maneuvers would slow it down. At one point, as we took a longer path around a clearing filled with thick undergrowth, we found ourselves cornered with no other option but to make a stand. 
My team assembled what makeshift traps and weaponry they could fashion with limited resources in mere minutes before catching sight of the horrific adversary again. This is it, I whispered to myself as the creature approached. It was now covered in blood and appeared even more menacing than before. Suddenly, our traps sprung into action. Sharpened branches swung down like pendulums while barbed wires wrapped around its legs, cutting deep into its flesh. The creature howled in agony. In unison, my teammates and I opened fire on the creature with every last bullet we had. Although our efforts left it severely injured, it didn't relent. Instead, it fought through the pain and lunged at one of my companions, its hardened talons tearing through flesh and bone with ease. My friend's screams were quickly swallowed by the surrounding foliage. As I watched the horror unfold before me, I noticed a deliberate pattern. The creature was systematically targeting and hunting each member of our team, one by one. Its primal ferocity made it clear that there was no hope of reasoning with it. This was more than just a battle for survival. This was revenge. Finally, when we had exhausted every option and dispatched all the weapons at our disposal, the creature paused, seemingly accepting its fate. With its body trembling under immense strain and loss of blood, it stared into my eyes. Something clicked within me, a horrifying revelation that I hadn't considered before. In that moment, I knew what we were facing, a Wendigo, a beast born from dark magic and twisted by human cruelty into an unstoppable force of destruction. As if sensing my thoughts, the Wendigo grinned menacingly. Then, in one swift motion, it disappeared into the shadows of the forest from which it came, leaving only death in its wake. I was always a logical guy, which helped me as a member of the secret Native American unit that hunted dangerous creatures from the dark corners of folklore. Most people dismissed the existence of these beings, but I had seen my fair share of terrifying things affect ordinary people. No matter how many encounters I had, I remained skeptical until faced with enough evidence. My name is Nolan Tocho, and this time was no different. My team and I were in rural Louisiana, investigating a series of gruesome deaths. The victims had all been found mutilated, their bodies ripped apart in unnatural ways as if by some massive beast with immense strength. As we sat in our cramped office on the edge of town, studying our case files, Finnegan Wolf, a cousin from the same tribe and fellow officer, teased me. Hey Nolan, calm down, man. We're like supernatural detectives. Finnegan said it lightheartedly trying to coax a smile from me. I can't focus on the job if you're laughing your head off, I replied dryly. But despite remaining serious about our situation, it brought a slight grin to my face. Late one night, while patrolling the dense swampland near where the incidents had taken place, something caught my eye, an unusual movement near the water's edge. It appeared to be swamp mud shifting and moving, but that wasn't possible. I cautiously moved closer, my heart pounding in my chest with each step. And then there it was, an enormous figure with strangely elongated limbs that seemed more like a landmass than an animal, and covered in muddy slime that oozed out from the water. Its eyes were large black orbs that seemed to absorb light rather than reflect it. Franklin Bridger was nearby and called out to me after noticing the horrifying creature approaching us. Our team began shouting commands and preparing their weapons as we backed away slowly from the creature. Communications failed for reasons unknown. We were stranded, left with nothing but our wits and our instincts. 
As the monster emerged from the shadowy swamp, we saw seven pairs of legs supporting its surprisingly swift movement. This was a creature unlike any we'd ever encountered, a foul being of swamp and mud with a hunger for destruction. With its disgusting form undulating and bubbling like some terrible nightmare come to life, it reached a heavy claw towards Finnegan. We tried to shoot at the creature as it grabbed Finnegan, his anguished screams breaking through the eerie silence of the swamp. But our weapons seemed useless against it, the bullets sinking into the mud-like surface without effect. The creature lashed out towards us and then reared back suddenly as a sickening crunch rang out in the night. It had torn Finnegan apart before our disbelieving eyes. Terrified that it would claim more victims before we could stop it, we concocted a desperate plan, thinking fast. We had found that fire caused pain to these creatures in the past. Their bodily fluids were sensitive to heat. Perhaps this would work as well. We needed to do something fast. Ellison Wilder, an expert with explosives on our team, scrambled to assemble Molotov cocktails from bottles he had picked up in town earlier while I distracted the creature. I threw rocks at its eyes, caught between abject fear and rage at the senseless death of my friend. Even now trapped by its range, my skepticism persisted as adrenaline coursed through my veins. As distracting and tiresome as this was, I knew that it was working, that we had a chance at least. It clung to an old mentality that had been reinforced by my faith in logic. No matter how impossible things may seem, there must be some way out of them. With a flickering light illuminating their twisted faces in the darkness and desperation driving their movements, Ellison unleashed the flaming bottles at the foe that had taken Finnegan's life. The monster screeched in pain as the flames engulfed it, festering wounds appearing on its pus-dripping skin. Our hope soared as we found its weakness, but our celebration was cut short when it charged forward in a frenzy of anger and agony. As the creature charged towards us, we realized that we couldn't call for help. Our communication devices were still malfunctioning, and we were deep in the swamp, far from town. We knew that time was not on our side, and we needed to take action immediately. With a surge of determination, Ellison threw another Molotov cocktail at the creature. The flames burned brighter this time, yet still not enough to halt their movements completely. It was obvious that the fire was causing impairment, but it wasn't strong enough to destroy it. Seeing no other option, Franklin quickly yelled a plan to us over the cacophony of crackling flames and the roars of agony coming from the monster. We surrounded it while avoiding its attack attempts and continued throwing flammable materials at it. This prevented it from escaping, confining it within a ring of fire as its movements slowed with each passing moment. Once the creature had been cornered and weakened by the fire, Franklin instructed us to search for sturdy branches that could be used as makeshift spears. This was our best chance at damaging the creature enough to buy us time for an escape. As we all jab at it simultaneously with our rudimentary weapons, its struggling softened. The combined force of fire and spears seemed to work better than bullets alone as we watched the creature writhe in pain before retreating into the murky depths of the swamp. Exhausted and heartsick over Finnegan's death, we made our way back to town to inform authorities about our experience. We thought hard about whether leaving town would be rational, or if staying put would be plausible. Ultimately, understanding how dangerous this creature continued to be, we had no choice but to wait for reinforcements. The need to properly confront this monster took precedence over everything else. 
We dedicated our energies towards preparing for further encounters with this unidentified being that was now not only determined but also aware of what we were capable of and out for revenge. When our backup arrived, we were ready. As we strategized, discussed, and planned our next move in collaboration with the team that had come to join us, it was clear that everybody was on edge. Lives had been lost, and no one wanted to take any chances. The failure of our previous attempts weighed heavily on us all. It wasn't until days later, Upon finally uncovering an old legend from a local historian about an ancient creature known as the Cajun Mud Beast or Manger de Terra, that I came to fully understand the horrifying antagonist we were up against. A being born from the earth and swamps of Louisiana itself, the creature had long tormented those who dared to enter its territory with a hunger for death and destruction. It was said to be nearly impossible to kill due to its origins in the earth itself. As we now knew the true nature of our enemy, the task ahead became even more daunting. Time would only tell if we could protect others from suffering Finnegan's tragic fate by stopping the Manjur de Terra once and for all. But as for now, it continued to lurk within the swamps, hidden in plain sight within its muddy realm waiting for its next victim to stumble into its deadly embrace. As I glanced up at the restaurant's menu board, my stomach churned in anticipation. My buddies, Craig and Sophia, chatted animatedly beside me as we waited to place our orders. For the past few months, we have been pursuing a mysterious and sinister being that hasn't revealed itself yet. That was our job, combating the elusive horrors lurking in the shadowy margins of society. I took a deep breath as I heard my order being called. None of us realized how drastically our lives would change after tonight. With our hot meals in hand, we found an empty bench and dug in, hungry from the day's investigation. We were interrupted by a shrill screech echoing through the night air. We locked eyes for a brief second before sprinting towards the unsettling noise. Our hearts pounded in our chests as we prayed we weren't too late to save whoever needed help. As we rounded a corner into a dimly lit alley, a macabre scene unfolded in front of us, an overturned garbage can and a half-eaten bagel smeared with crimson blood. There was no trace of the victim whose blood painted this gruesome canvas. Whatever attacked him had taken him away. Craig dialed 911 while Sophia crouched down to examine what remained of the bagel. It bore distinctive teeth marks that didn't resemble any known species we had encountered. An overwhelming wave of dread washed over us, realizing the monstrosity we were up against. Swallowing my fear with determined resolve, I murmured to my friends, We need to find this thing before it strikes again. Sophia nodded solemnly, her eyes filled with both trepidation and conviction. We continued throughout the night, following faint clues hinting at our monstrous perpetrator. As we ventured deeper into uncharted territory, a mysterious fog crept onto the streets, giving an eerie atmosphere to an already ominous journey. As the darkness enveloped us, faint growls resonated from an indistinct distance. I could feel the hairs on the back of my neck prickle up as if I were being watched. We need to be cautious, Craig whispered, his voice laden with anxiety. We're treading on unmarked territory now. We trudged further into the mist when we stumbled upon a dilapidated building that seemed to buckle under the weight of its many years. Cautiously, we crept closer and entered the structure, on high alert for any signs of danger. Within the decaying walls, 
we found a horrifying tapestry of flesh scraps and gnawed bones intertwined with shredded cloth, evidence of our antagonist's grisly handiwork. My stomach contorted at the nauseating sight and smell, overwhelming my senses and making me gag. With teary eyes and a racing heart, I turned to Sophia, who looked similarly disturbed. We can't let this monster hurt anyone else, she pronounced with determination. Though repulsed by our surroundings, we kept pressing inward until we reached what must have been a boiler room in better days now repurposed as a lair for something unthinkable. In it stood the fearsome creature we had been hunting, the epitome of malevolent legends that passed from generation to generation, whispering tales that chilled the marrow in one's bones. Its monstrous form towered over us with razored claws and gnashing teeth that oozed thick saliva, carrying an unmistakable metallic tang. Razor spines protruded from its coarse, mottled hide. It was undoubtedly designed for death-dealing. My mouth went dry as I reached for the concealed weapon strapped to my hip. Taking shallow breaths and trying to stay calm, a silent standoff ensued before it pounced forward, claws outstretched to carve us apart. I hastily dove and Craig yanked Sophia away just in time to avoid the creature's first assault. We dodged and weaved as the beast lunged after us. One swipe from those claws could be lethal. We worked together to confuse and disorient our foe, taken aback by its relentless thirst for our blood. In the heat of battle, I'd barely whispered a few words of thanks to whatever spirits may have been watching over us. Craig unloaded a few carefully aimed shots at the monstrous behemoth, while Sophia hurled anything she could find to create a barricade. I managed to land a solid kick to the creature's side, sending it reeling for a moment. That brief window offered the opportunity we needed to escape. As we scrambled out of the decrepit building, Sophia fumbled with her phone attempting to call for help as the fog swallowed us whole. Come on, come on, she muttered, desperately trying to get the call connected. But all attempts were futile. It seemed that the fog was interfering with cell reception. While fleeing from the frenzied beast, Craig's voice cut through the damp air. We're not going to make it far like this, he grunted. We need a better plan. Knowing that Craig was right and that calling for help wasn't an option, we changed our course and headed for an abandoned warehouse nearby. The warehouse would provide us with more space. Space, we hoped, would allow us to escape the deadly menace chasing us through its metallic innards. We dodged dark gaps between piles of rubble and jumped over broken furniture all while trying not to lose each other in the darkness and mist that had seeped indoors. The creature was relentless in pursuit. Its grotesque anomalies made it adaptable in both dim corners and open spaces. It twisted and contorted itself among metallic pillars as it pursued us with ferocious determination. As we continued our desperate flight through the warehouse, Sophia spotted a network of pipes overhead that seemed suitable for climbing, possibly granting us temporary respite from this stalking nightmare. With little time to spare, each of us swiftly scaled the nearest pipe moments before the creature reached our position. From above, we watched as it tore apart anything within reach, shattered glass and splintered wood raining down onto the cold concrete floor below. By some miracle, thanks to our makeshift perch, we survived its onslaught relatively unscathed. While still trembling at our close call, we noticed the creature appearing to tire, its demeanor momentarily less vicious. Sensing that the time might be right, we carefully descended from our pipe haven and made a break for the nearest exit. Our lungs burned as we sprinted from the warehouse the creature's savage screeches echoing behind us. Through streets that were eerily silent, 
Our chase continued with no end in sight, until it became painfully obvious that we could not outrun this monstrosity forever. Suddenly, from a dim corner, another figure emerged. It was Craig's neighbor, Mr. Matthews, wielding a shotgun. He fired two shots into the creature, stumbling it for a moment and affording us precious seconds to catch our breaths. Why didn't you call for help? He demanded angrily between reloads. We could hear the commotion from my place, but your phones must have been unreachable. We tried. Sophia panted frantically. Phone reception died when that fog rolled in. Mr. Matthews shook his head solemnly before training his eyes back onto our monstrous predator. We ain't done yet, he said darkly. As the brutal skirmish continued, I couldn't help but focus on how wretched our circumstances had become and think back to that blood-stained bagel, how such an ordinary object had shattered our quiet lives and thrust us into this deadly confrontation against an aberration spawned straight from hell. We fought with all our strength and ingenuity for what seemed like an eternity until Mr. Matthews landed one final shot driving the beast back into the shadows it originated from. The rancid fog dissipated as though answering its master's call. Left on the edge of exhaustion, we searched through ancient records and went through various encounters with similar creatures until we arrived at only one explanation. This terrifying entity was a shapeshifter, a mythical fiend found exclusively in scattered folktales throughout the ages plaguing mankind and feasting on their fear. Though we survived that harrowing night, the grim knowledge that this wicked beast had been present for centuries and its apparent ability to change forms now hang over us like a malignant shroud. While the shapeshifter's existence remained concealed from the rest of humanity, we knew in our hearts that it was only biding its time before returning to the shadows once more preying on another hapless soul. The heavy rain pounded on the roof of the cabin. I had never experienced rain this dense, especially in this part of the country. It was a small, secluded cabin tucked away in an isolated forest reserve, miles away from the nearest neighborhood. The cabin was my temporary headquarters while I worked for a special unit within a secret organization of Native Americans charged with hunting down and eliminating folklore creatures that threatened local communities and beyond. My name is Kim Lomesai. Kim meaning secret and Lomesai translating to pretty flower. It was an ironic choice since my work was anything but pretty. As I sat at the table in my kitchen, planning my next expedition, I couldn't help but chuckle at the absurdity of all I'd seen. Suddenly, there was a knock on the door. I peeked through the window, not expecting anyone, and certainly not in this kind of weather. Shivering from head to toes to Jacob. Rock skull, white crow. He was my colleague, too stubborn and sarcastic for most to be around, but he knew his folklore like no other. Seriously, Keem? You really need to invest in some towels or something, groaned Jacob cheerfully after I opened the door. I laughed. Ah, oh, well, you know me. Always too paranoid to make it easy for anyone to find us. Jacob shook off the rainwater before pulling out a map and spreading it on the table. We've got our mission. You want to hear something you've never heard before? A giant mantis-like creature has been spotted roaming around a suburban area here. He pointed at the map where we would be working next. Quite a few people have vanished so far. Ha, huh, well, that's indeed something new, I agreed. But remember when they told us about that goat-legged giant crow-wing-wielding cloven-hoof thing? He chuckled. 
Oh, how could I forget? It turned out to be nothing but a twisted scarecrow with goat legs and crow wings. We started to prepare ourselves for our journey. Silently, we both knew that this was no laughing matter. We arrived at the suburban location the following day. The sky had cleared up, but there were still remnants from last night's rainstorm. We decided to set up camp right outside the affected community. That first night, we barely slept when we heard loud scratching outside their camp. Cautiously, we approached the source of the noise, expecting a stray dog or maybe a raccoon rummaging through our supplies. Instead, when the flashlight beam hit the creature, my blood ran cold. Towering over us was a grotesque mantis-like entity. Its enormous, sharp mandibles clicked together as its compound eyes stared directly at us. Jacob and I exchanged looks of absolute terror before launching into action. With almost telepathic synchronicity, we moved to evade and attack this monstrous being. As I swung my weapon at one of its limbs, Jacob fired off rounds from his sidearm into the creature's pulsating thorax. It screeched in pain and resentment before violently swiping back with its barbed forelegs. One such sudden swipe caught me by the side and hurled me onto a nearby tree trunk. In pain but wanting to help Jacob in his struggle against this fearsome adversary, I watched my esteemed partner stagger backward as he narrowly escaped the creature's colossal grasp, only to trip over some discarded camping equipment. The mantis monster lunged toward Jacob for what could be the final strike. My vision blurred as blood spilled from my wound. Desperation drove me in, now fueled by adrenaline. With all my strength, I pushed myself off the tree and charged towards the creature. Jacob managed to roll out of the way just in time as I tackled the mantis monster, knocking it off balance. The creature screeched angrily as it flailed back, its legs clicking against the ground as it tried to regain its footing. Keem, we need backup! Jacob shouted, grabbing his radio to call our companions at the secret organization's headquarters. Unfortunately, our transmission was disrupted by an unknown force, and we couldn't get through. With no other options left, we had to face the giant mantis alone. Knowing that we were already injured and running on limited energy, Jacob and I decided not to confront the creature directly. Instead, we focused on retreating through the dense forest terrain in hopes of losing it. We ran for what felt like hours, avoiding traps and pitfalls made by the creature. Everywhere we looked, there were signs of its devastating presence. Trees uprooted with deep gouges in their trunks, half-eaten animals littering the forest floor, even bones and remnants of clothing belonging to its human victims. Finally, exhausted and fearing we wouldn't be able to outrun this fearsome enemy any longer, we devised a plan involving one of us creating a distraction while the other prepared a trap using our remaining equipment trip wires, flares, and explosive charges fashioned into makeshift landmines. After some discussion, I volunteered to create a distraction. I poured my remaining energy into taunting the creature into chasing me while Jacob laid out our trap. Despite my injuries slowing me down considerably, the mantis kept its distance. It seemed like it was merely toying with us now. As I lured the gigantic mantis closer, I caught glimpses of Jacob setting up our impromptu trap between two large trees near a small clearing just ahead. Once he finished, he nodded at me from his position and disappeared into the dense foliage beyond. As planned, I led the creature into the clearing before dodging to the left and diving into a concealed hole filled with leaves barely avoiding the explosion that rocked the forest. The ground shook beneath us, 
and a deafening boom echoed as our traps seemingly stopped the monstrous mantis in its tracks cautiously emerging from my hiding spot. I glanced over at Jacob, who was already on his feet and inspecting what remained of the foul creature. Smoke still billowed around us, but we both breathed a momentary sigh of relief that we'd successfully halted its rampage. However, as we examined the scene closely, something felt wrong. This terrifying antagonist appeared to be nothing more than an ordinary giant mantis, albeit greatly mutated in size and strength. How could such a creature become so aggressive and deadly? And why now? The unsettling truth revealed itself in our final moments within that small clearing. As we turned to leave, we saw it, a thin, black tendril slithering away from the mantis corpse. The true antagonist had been hiding in plain sight the entire time, a parasitic creature manipulating its host into committing horrific acts of violence upon innocent victims.